All right, what's up? Welcome, everybody. I know you're all thinking that it was Boomer Tech. No, it wasn't. I needed to make sure that the video was going to play while I'm talking. So, we're going to do a little bit of a sound check. We need to make sure we can hear old, old crispy Michael Shermer. And I can't. There we go. World Christian Encyclopedia. 84% of the world's population belongs. All right. Can y'all hear that? And then while these dudes literally wait to start mowing until I start my stream. So they had all day to mow. Make sure we, that. And I can't. Yeah. Y'all yep. like I cut my own hair. Y'all like how I cut my hair. I did party in the back, party in the front, potty in the back, potty in the front. Dude, why are you trying to mow right now? Mow and mow and mow. Don't know where we're going to. We lie, we cheat, and we run from... Remember that the '90s? See how it? It's like a a rat or a uh, what do you call it? It's like a skunk in the back. Why did I do that? Well, cause I was lazy and I needed a haircut, and I was like, I don't feel like I don't feel like going to. Denisha, my stylist. Y'all need to turn the volume on those mowing machines down. Somebody needs to invent a low volume mow machine. Welcome, everybody. If you would, hit like and share. We're live. I'm very quiet, or the mowing is quiet. Uh, actually, I wasn't thinking about Theo Vaughn when I put my hair uh, like this I put my hair up today <laughs> but then I realized this does look like Theo Vaughn so we'll just say it's a tribute to Theo Vaughn sure uh, can y'all hear me or am I low Milo what my style is named Denisha she got three kids she worked uh, two jobs Well, she did. She said, put your hair up. She said, put your hair up. And she said, ooh, you look like a diva. I said, I am a diva. Always have been, always will be. Thank you for that compliment. And then she put my hair in the little machine at Fantastic Sam's. And did you know that that can spit out a piece of candy when they put that in there? That is crazy. I don't even know how that works. That's some freaking sorcery, dude. Sorcery going on up in Fantastic Sam's. Spitting out, putting hair in, making candy. <laughs> dude. They were telling us all along what was going on. <laughs> oh, baby. Yep. So, everybody loves these. We've had a lot of fun with the debate reviews. I already had this all ready to go. And then, as you can imagine... Anytime you, I'm not even going to explain it to you, it's not worth it, it's boring and dumb, you don't care. Thank you for that super chat, we'll get to those in a moment. So, I've not heard this debate, uh, and it's even going to be better than normal because everybody's going to be like, you atheists, you got owned by a dude with a mullet. You can't even make better arguments than a freaking mullet having dude can tear apart then atheism is obviously not true. So I'm doing like a high level Tennessee man, Florida man psyop because if a man with a mullet and yes, it is a mullet right now. Look, if a man with a mullet can demolish a bunch of atheist, terrible arguments, then atheism is not true. Is it? And we call that, uh, that's not, you could put that into a logical form. And then we call that a vinegar diagram, right? Not a Venn diagram, a damn vinegar diagram. 
because I'm from Tennessee and Florida, and I don't know what the connection to vinegar is, but it sounded like it would it would work, right? No Venn diagrams. We got vinegar diagrams. Apple cider vinegar diagrams. Um, y'all know what a Venn diagram is? Come on now. Uh, and I've got other good news that I'm gonna tell you in a little bit. So we have again uh, our spot, <coughs> our sponsor. I cut my hair and there was hair everywhere. I got hair in my throat, hair in my eyes, hair in my nose. I ground it up and I went, I went, I snorted a line in my own hair just to see what it would do. And bro, I was to the moon. It's actually better than meth. You should try it, except don't. That's dangerous. Don't ever do that. You can't snort anyone's hair but my hair. Otherwise, don't do that. Um, yeah. So, let's get started. And as I promised you, we're going to open up with uh, a uh, critique of Michael uh, Trademark Professional Skeptic Shermer. It's funny how uh, the skepticism of Michael Shermer is literally always the establishment party line. So skepticism literally is just a repeater, like a record playing over and over of whatever the establishment says. So literally no skepticism beyond the establishment. And we were saying this about the skeptics 10 years ago, right? This is nothing new. The skeptics have never been skeptical of the establishment. They've never been skeptical of skepticism. They're not actually that intelligent to even be skeptical of skepticism, which they don't really seem to understand is actually a worldview. It's actually a paradigm. So now we're way out of the domain of like that level of philosophy when we're talking about these people. And that's why you get the professional skeptics saying, don't study or look at philosophy. And you're you're about to get beat. And deconstructed by a dude with a freaking mullet. Again, I can't stress the power of that, the import of that. To lose a debate, well, debate review. You get demolished, right? By a freaking dude in Tennessee with a mullet. That's going to be the greatest own of all time. <laughs> it's jokes, by the way. Like, Father Damick said that you should never say that you should demolish people in a debate when, like, obviously we're joking. He can't tell satire and, like, when we're not being silly. Like, my old satire videos, he took them seriously and thought that I was an insane person who denied the existence of North Korea. <laughs> uh, okay, sure. Yeah, actually, I'm a North Korean truther. There is no such thing as it doesn't exist. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're about to get started with old Dr. Shermer, Dr. Schrecker, and with that Shrek's fedora. And I have not heard this. So you are going to embark on a journey with me as we together deconstruct terrible atheist arguments. And uh, yes, so Sir Skeptic did another video coming after us that's another reason why I did this uh, so I thought we, we would go back to deconstructing the atheists and as you guys know uh, there will be the debate with Trent Horn in October probably about I forget what he said sometime in October so that'll be coming up and it's going to be relevant to this because we're going to be debating natural theology is natural theology something that Christians should believe uh, I will be taking the negative. He will be taking the affirmative. So that's going to be a fun debate. Uh, we, I'm glad he was willing to do that instead of the same old papacy debate, which has been had a million times. So I wanted to do something a little more interesting, and he was down with that. So that's cool. And I, I like Trent. Trent's a cool guy, at least from, I don't know him personally, but from the debates, I like I like his debates. I think he's a good debater. Uh, probably one of the better debaters out there that I can think of. The cosmic skeptic debate was great, which we did analyze a few months ago. So this is similar to that series, if you recall, the cosmic skeptic debate. 
and we did Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris and we did Hitchens and William Lane Craig and we did Cosmic Skeptic and Trent Horn and uh, we did maybe one or two more. I don't remember what the other ones were, but maybe Matt, Matt Dillahunty and Jordan. No, no. Matt uh, Dillahunty and Jordan Peterson. That was a good one. Um, but before we kick off the Hitchens D'Souza debate, I don't know anything about Dinesh D'Souza's apologetics. Uh, I've never watched any of his stuff. Except I think he made that uh, Obama movie. Uh, I think he made an Obama movie. Uh, we're not going to do this. Okay? Uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to do a bunch of apologetics today. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, we're we're going to do. We're going to do what we got to do. That, that's pretty good, Obama. I haven't done I haven't done my Obama impression in like two years, but I think that's how it goes. So I, I'm assuming, though, I'm just going to assume that Dinesh D'Souza is probably an evidentialist. Um, but I don't know. So we are going to have fun. We always have fun. But yet one thing you'll notice, too, is that uh, we always hear the same stuff, don't we? The arguments never change. The controlled opposition, it's not really controlled opposition, I'm making a joke, but the controlled opposition theist, atheist debates are literally no different than the year 1700. And it's annoying and confusing because it's like the theists don't even realize that people have, they have progressed in a positive way, apologetics, to have better arguments, to address the very objections of especially the skeptical atheists, right? Those in the Humean Kantian tradition, aka the transcendental argument. And this is just, Nobody pays attention to this. Uh, and I think there's multiple reasons for that. Um, most of the apologists out there, it's not that they're not intelligent people, so don't misunderstand me. Uh, they're all very intelligent. All of them. Uh, William Lane Craig is intelligent. Trent Horn is intelligent. Uh, Jordan Peterson is intelligent. Who else has done this this debate? I assume Dinesh D'Souza is intelligent. I don't know much about him, so I'm not trying to be insulting. I just don't know much about him. But they don't... Um, they don't seem to be aware of epistemology. So the running theme that I'm noticing, and this was something that bon Dr. Bonson pointed out when he debated Sproul, was that it's almost like you've never taken epistemology classes. Like you're admitting, you know, that we, we, you know, when we come to the table to do debate that we have to obey the rules. And if you've been listening to the discord debates recently that we've had, you guys know that we've had a lot of uh, atheists show up and uh, probably as a result of the, you know, sort of skeptic videos and whatnot. And the, the atheists show up and they typically don't know anything about, epistemology or logic but then they kind of realize that well now wait a minute uh i can't just kind of make up whatever i want i can't do whatever i want right like i have to come to the table and agree to the rules and that's because the rules are objective you see just like in chess when you come to the table to the chess board and you want to sit down and play chess right not chest chess I know a lot of y'all want to play chess with me. But we're not doing that. You come to the, you sit down and you, if you don't agree to the rules of chess, you're not playing chess anymore, right? I think everybody knows this, right? Like if I bring my Monopoly pieces and, oh, uh, I'm going to set my house, my I'm going to put my rook over on boardwalk. Everybody's going to be like, that makes no sense. So in other words, everyone has agreed to the rules of chess. And there's a logic, an objective logic to the rules of chess, which if you changed up all the rules, it would screw the whole game up, right? Now, uh, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm also not saying that logic is only true because everybody agrees on it. That's like the next mistake that the atheists always make. Oh, well, it's just, it's just like whatever society came up with, dude, like... If we wanted to, tomorrow, we could all sign a contract that, like, 5 plus 5 equals 4, right? 
and it would be true according to the atheists. Okay, so I mean, this is like so low level. I don't know how they can't figure out that no mathematics is actually reflecting objective principles in the world. That's why the same formulas build bridges each time, right? They build skyscrapers and they build Black Hawk helicopters, and they don't just can't just change them and then make the same stuff. It won't work. They won't fly. They won't, you know, the rockets won't do their rocket thing. So the point being is that they that logic is objective. The rules of logic reflect objective principles that are true in the world. And so that being the case, you can't have a, a, a social construct view, a relativistic view, a nominalist view, a materialist view of numbers, etc. Things that we've hammered many, many times. And so what we're going to notice, however, is that in these debates, the, the debate never gets to that tier. There was a couple times when Jordan Peterson almost went in the direction of transcendental argument. William Lane Craig almost kind of asked a few questions in that, but they always just sort of back off. So they play this very watered down, just lame. It's just weak, dude. It's weak sauce, right? And all I'm trying to tell you guys is that it's so annoying to hear the same debates over and over and over. And the same dumb arguments over... It's almost like it's supposed to be this way, right? I mean, I'm not really being that conspiratorial. Because I don't. I actually don't think these people are that competent. They're not as competent as they think they are. And so I think a lot of these people just actually don't even understand the transcendental argument. They don't actually get what it is, how it works. And that is the biggest problem with the transcendental argument. Is that you can make a simple version of it. But the biggest problem is that it kind of requires a little bit of an IQ. And so many of these people uh, are deficient in that arena. <laughs> they, they're lacking in the IQ arena, unfortunately, especially the atheists. So uh, if our best so-called public theist apologists can't get it, we're in a bad, we're in a bad position. You know, things are pretty bad. Um, no. They will never in a million years let me on to debate any of these people. Um, and again, everybody always asks us, when are you going to debate Sam Harris, dude? When are you going to debate Richard Dawkins, dude? When are you going to debate... Matt Dillahunty, Stefan, those are probably the biggest atheist debates we'll ever have. There will never be an atheist above that level who were at, will ever agree to a debate. Why? Because there's nothing for them to gain and everything to lose. Imagine being demolished... But then to keep in mind, too, it might not even work because the majority of the crowd, the, the most people, um, have a hard time with the transcendental argument. So, catch-22, dude. <laughs> uh, so, I, so, we have skeptical atheists in the audience who I said could come on if he wants to. Uh, I don't know if you joined the Discord. I gave you the link if you wanted to join the Discord. And yes, I'll let you come in here and you can you can set us all straight with, I'm sure, what will be super high-tier argumentation that we've never heard before. Uh, if you would like to, you're welcome to. Um, I don't know if they vetted you or if you joined. I'm looking through the vetter, vetting. Uh, I don't see you joining today, so I'm gonna I'm what ready for, get ready for it. Here comes the my mic doesn't work. Right? Our Discord has this amazing power to literally just destroy microphones. As soon as you come in there, it's like an EMP. It just demolishes. Nobody's microphone works in my Discord, which is funny because like every phone comes with a microphone now, and every everybody's microphone works except for people who are atheists. Or Roman Catholics. Their microphones don't work. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, his argument was rights are rights. Yeah. So th this is the level of circularity and low IQ that we typically get in the atheists. There is the link. Uh, you can hop on. Gmail. Gmail. has nothing to do with Gmail, dude. Discord. Nothing to do with Gmail. There's the link. And uh, I'll be looking. And you can hop on, hop on in. And you will get all of the e-celebrity time that you crave. 
we will make you famous. You can be a C tier e celeb with me, a B tier e celeb. Uh, and but I don't see so if I see you popping in the vetting, we'll vet you. Uh, all right, let's get started with this because we will never get through with this if we don't. So somebody just popped up in there. That's not you though. So the first is Shermer's uh, speech at Oxford. And sometimes these Oxford things are okay. They're actually not always terrible. I've watched a few of these. Um, there's a one, there's one with Peter Hitchens that's actually good that shows that classical debate styles use rhetoric. They use uh, jabs, humor, jokes, and insults. That's actually part of rhetoric. So I don't know where people came up with the uh, made up idea that you can't use jokes or insults or jabs or rhetoric in debates. I remember when IP tried to say you may you may not use any jabs or insults or anything I perceive to be an insult in a debate with me. And I said, no, that's not how debates work. Um, go watch Peter Hitchens classic um, response, I think, to his brother. I don't remember, but it's one of these uh, Oxford Union debates. So let's get into Michael Shermer. Let's see his uh, level of argumentation. And again, what we're going to see is what we always see, right? The atheists are working at a really low tier. Uh, they have little to no knowledge of epistemology, especially no knowledge of metaphysics. I've met maybe I've met one or two atheists in my life, in my life, who know anything about metaphysics at all. And the reason for that is that, like, you know, 95% of atheists jump into philosophy, if they know it, uh, from the Enlightenment on. And the Enlightenment is predicated on rejecting metaphysics. So, for the most part. So, which is inconsistent, but who, you know, so much for, we're not going to expect too much consistency here, right? <laughs> from this domain. I have a heavy accent. Yeah, shocker. So, uh, again, you know, there's the link. You either show up or you don't. Let's get into it. So here's Shermer. Uh, he's going to start and we're going to pause. As you know, we pause and we listen and we see if the arguments are valid or solid or whatever. And then we comment. And it's a lot of fun. It's a it's a nerd, Chad nerd party fest. Party in the back, party in the front. Which is, some form of organized religion. is that good? Can you guys hear it? Christians have about 2 billion of those 5.9 billion, about half of those are Catholics. Muslims come in at just a tad over 1 billion. Hindus at around 850 million. Buddhists at almost 400 million. Give me just one second. I think I'll have to make him up. I can barely hear him, so let me turn him up here. All right, so he should pop back here in a second. What's with this? I'm all, I'm I'm grossed out by the dude in the audience. That's like, look at this dude right here, ferociously biting his, like that dude is going to town on his fingers. That dude's got some like, as he he's nervous about this debate. <laughs> like, like that guy, look at this guy. Like the, he's like a damn woodland creature gnawing at a freaking peanut butter covered walnut. That dude is going to town on that finger. Anyway, I'm sorry. I got distracted from these terrible arguments. So the first argument is, um, what would we call this? Uh, an, 
appeal to probability. Uh, so the fact that many people have differing theological opinions within the realm of theism and Christianity versus the other world religions, Islam, etc. What are the chances that Christianity has it right? Well, that is not a good argument because on the one hand, the same argument could be made for any position. So within the domain of agnosticism, atheism, unbelief, we could probably find just as many differing positions. So we could turn that around and be like, yeah, but that doesn't prove or disprove anything, really. I mean, I suppose you can ask the question about probabilities, but the problem is that from the outset, I forgot my whiteboard, my white boy whiteboard. We got it right here, though. Uh, I would like to know a what audio is bad. The audio for him or audio for me? Uh, I mean, I'm I should be talking loud right here. Can y'all hear me okay? Or is this dude trolling? I can never see people want to mess up. What audio is bad? Uh, so first argument is it's not probable. But I think you guys know where we where we would go after this. Now, this is only a 16-minute presentation, so we don't know where exactly Michael Shermer is going to take this discussion. Uh, okay, so I'm just deleting that dude because he's probably trolling. Shermer's audio is low. Actually, I think it's the the original video because. Let me see if I can make it any louder. I think it's this video because I've got it maxed and I've got him maxed. So that's the best I can do for him. Right. And actually all of these people uh, say the same stuff. So hopefully the audio and the other one will be louder. Let me make sure it's all the way up. Okay. So... Uh, thank you to my whiteboard who is actually in the chat and also with me at the same time. So we actually have a, a whiteboard that's able to time travel and do like by location portal level stuff here, dude. Um, anyway, so the, so the first argument is not probable. I guess you guys know probably where I'm going to go with responding to that. But let's get to the rest of this. It'll take it a second to come back because I had to switch between sources. So it'll, it'll come back in just a second. And then I'll move, I'll move it back when he pops back in. Look at that atheist dude. Look at that. Look at that chubby dude. That, that dude's got us. This dude's got a serious case of atheism going on over here. He was like, how can I be uh Bieber? He looks like Samwise Gamgee mixed with Bieber mixed with every reddit atheist uh, mixed with keith urban um uh, like three doors down haircut basically okay let's go back is the sound better i've got him all the way up So he's supposed to be coming through the multi output device. Is it not going? Is he? He's coming through mine, isn't he? Uh, so we had this right when we watched the movie. Um, dang, dude, that was so, I had it set so perfect when we watched the movie. Yeah, so he's coming through. 
We don't want him coming through the Mac speakers. Oh, wait a minute. I think I got to click on the MIDI thing. Output, multi output device, supposed to be yes, that. Is it that stupid MIDI thing? I think is what I got to have popped up. So I had this perfect, right? And then what happened is anytime you close audio MIDI setup, yeah, anytime you close this, everything resets. So we've got the two channel up. We've got that. We've got that. Everything should be good to go. Why is he coming through the wrong thing? Our story goes back millions of years. So put yourself back in time. Let's say three and a half million years ago. You're a little hominid on the plains of Africa. A little Australopithecine. Your name is Lucy. Thank you. A lot of people in America don't get that joke. <laughs> and you hear a rustle in the grass. Is it a dangerous predator or is it just the wind? Well, if you assume that the rustle in the grass is a dangerous predator and it turns out it's just the wind, you've made a type 1 error, a false positive. You thought A was connected to B, but you're wrong. That's a relatively harmless error to make. You just become more cautious, vigilant, skittish, like you see animals on the plains of Africa today. On the other hand, if you think the rustle in the grass is just the wind, and it turns out it's a dangerous predator, your lunch. Congratulations, you've just been given a Darwin Award for taking yourself out of the gene pool early before reproducing. <laughs> Uh, okay, I think I've got the sound fixed, right? So I had to click all the right MIDI crap settings, but can you hold it? It's freaking hot in here, dude. I got to turn the air on. Woo! False positives rather than false negatives. Now, why can't you just sit there in the grass and collect more data until you get it right? Because predators don't wait around for prey animals to collect more data. That's why they're stealthy and stalk their prey. They're so, filthy? Did he say they're filthy? <laughs> Let's go back. America don't get that joke. <laughs> Americans are so stupid. In the grass. Is it a dangerous predator? Or is it... Hear a Russell? Russell Crow? Russell Brand? What kind of rustle in the grass? Just the wind. Oh, so you are is dust in the wind. Dangerous predator. It turns out it's just the wind. She's like the wind. You've made a type 1 error, a false positive. You thought A was connected to B, but you're wrong. That's a relatively harmless error to make. You just become more cautious, vigilant, skittish, like you see animals on the plains of Africa today. On the other hand, if you think the rustle in the grass is just the wind, and it turns out it's a dangerous predator, your lunch. Congratulations, you've just been given a Darwin Award for taking yourself out of the gene pool early before reproducing. <laughs> What year is this? Okay, so 2012. Okay, I mean, I, this these Darwin Award jokes. I mean, if this if he's still making these kind of jokes nowadays, I mean, they're lame in 2012, but I mean, still. Versus type two errors, false positives rather than false negatives. Now, why can't you just sit there in the grass and collect more data until you get it right? Because predators don't wait around for prey animals to collect more data. That's why they're stealthy. And stalk their prey. Stealthy. I thought he said so filthy. Filthy. To make snap decisions. The rule of thumb snap. is assume all rustles in the ground. Ernie. 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 I've got the power. Snap. But the crack of the whip, I snap attack front to back in this thing called rap. <laughs> Turn up the trouble. Radical rhymes day and night all the time. 714. Line for line. <laughs> Maniac, Brainiac, winning the game. I'm the lyrical Jesse James. Ernie, eh, eh, Ernie, eh. I've got the power. So he said snap, dude. That's are dangerous predators and not the wind, just in case. So everything you read and hear and see 
is real. Now, what's the difference between the wind and a dangerous predator? The wind is an inanimate force. A dangerous predator is an intentional agent. His intention is to eat me, and that probably can't be good. So we also evolved the capacity not only to find these patterns and make those one kinds of errors instead of the other, assume everything is real, we also infuse into those patterns intentional agency. We just think everything is not just real, but real and animated, alive, even if it's invisible. We now have a lot of evidence from cognitive psychology that this begins at a very early age, perhaps as early as age two or three. I, I'll just give you one experiment among many. A Jesse Baring's research of little children uh, who are brought into a room, they're given one of these little balls with Velcro on it, and you throw it at the dartboard and it sticks on it. That's the goal. So they're brought into the room, but they're not allowed to just do that with their good hand. They're turned, they're turned around and they have to do it backwards. What is he doing? Hand. What is he talking about? Where is he going? So he's rambling about cognitive science. Look at that dude in the background. I am mystified by the wisp of that fat dude's hair. What is going on with that? <laughs> Samwise Bieber. And, and then the Bro, just cut that. Like, he's got that one streak. Just cut it, dude. You don't even need... It. Like, why is that there? He leaves the room, and, and he says, just do the best you can and come out and tell me how you did. So, of course, they all walk up there and just stick it on the thing, right? All right. Part two of the experiment... Uh, the little children are brought in, and each of them is told, right next to the dartboard is a chair here. On the chair is Princess Anne. She's an invisible princess, and she can see every... I thought he said Princess Anne, like Prince. <laughs> like Raspberry Beret Prince. I was like, Prince. ...thing you're doing. Experimenter leaves the room. All of a sudden, the children stop going up the chair. The shadow... So invisible. The... Sort of infusion of agency of an invisible being in the chair that sees what we do, keeps track of our moral behavior, begins at a very early age. Our brains have evolved this capacity for agency. That's the earliest God believes. Okay, next line of evidence. Here's what happened about five to seven thousand years ago. These animistic, simple God beliefs and sort of social religions that evolved to help us uh, live together as a social primate species, began to break down as populations grew from a couple dozen to a couple hundred individuals to thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people. In so here we have a grand uh, historical narrative, right? By the way, I've, I've been making a bunch of notes. We're going to go through every one of these, these attempted arguments. But my freaking whiteboard is not being, it's being a, it's being a damn white Karen right now. Grand historical narrative. Uh, and as you know, none of this is empirically verified, right? That's ironic, won't, won't it be? States won't it be? Yes, it will. and tribes, the chiefs and states, we needed some more formal means of behavior control and enforcing the rules of social cooperation. Two institutions evolved for that. Government and religion. Government says, here's a copy of the rules, everybody gets one, and here's the punishments if you break the rules. Religion says, if you think you got away with it, and you cheated the state, nah, there's an eye in the sky that knows all and sees all, and in the next life, justice will be served. That's a very powerful force for social control. Oh, I see where he's going now. It with little kids. You can do it with adults, uh, which is what churches are all about. So that's the modern version. That's what happens with that. Now, second line of inquiry on social phenomena and comparative world religions. Is the fact that the envelope calculation within an order of magnitude ac accuracy we can safely I uh, conclude that over the last 10,000 years of history, there's been about 10,000 different religions and roughly about 1,000 different gods. Again, the house question for you, which side of the room you leave on tonight. What is the probability that Yahweh is the one true God in Amun-Ra, Aphrodite, Apollo, Baal, Brahma, Ganesha? 
Isis, Mithras, Osiris, Shiva, Thor, Vishnu, Wanton, Zeus, and the other 986 gods are all false gods. You guys are atheists, just like me, of all the gods I just rattled off. Some of us just go one god further. Now, think about this as another thought experiment. Now, uh, let's pause here and let's work through the ones that uh, the so-called arguments that he's presented so far. Because I think we see the direction he's going. Um, and we're going to bring out our little whiteboard. What's up, whiteboard? Get out of the way. So, where are we so far in the chart of fallacy, fallacious argumentation? First argument is that it's not probable, and he's going to be listing several reasons why. Now, he doesn't actually offer definitive, like, objective proofs. He just kind of lists probable, log like, likely scenarios for the uh, origin of religion and government. And so he says that uh, if, you, if you think about it, <clears throat> religion arises as a way to control the masses and we know this from what from cognitive science so scientific studies have shown that a child develops these uh you know patterns and tendencies on the basis of things that he experienced uh, as a child so when he was a child the parents told him no i'm watching you and so he uh, stopped stealing cookies because he thought there was an invisible parent watching at all times and this evolves as the child grows older into the repeated patterns of oh i'm being watched by invisible sky daddy you see right so that's the argument he's making and he's saying that more cognitive science shows this and then he says that we just presume that there's an invisible being that has agency because the primitive men assume that the invisible forces had agency right so if there was a predator uh you know stalking you intended to eat you then the natural forces who might destroy you like you know hurricanes uh, uh you know um that kind of stuff right Th then they must have had agency behind them as well everything has agency and so this is just a uh, cognitive bias that we have from growing up as children being told that these things are the case and then he goes on to say that this is the account for government there's a, he has a grand historical narrative that this is how we know thousands of years ago government arose. Uh, it must have ar arisen from these presuppositions and from this account of probabilistic cognitive science, right? Which all of which, by the way, is absolutely non-empirical. We have no empirical data from aeons ago as to how exactly the first societies arose how the first societies structure themselves. Now, you'll say, oh, but we, we have museums. Haven't you been to a museum? Well, that's, again, presupposing that we have the correct dating methods and uh, civilizational records that we have, which those have actually changed many times. The dating of, you know, the different eras, Paleolithic, etc. These have actually changed, and they're based on presuppositions which are non-demonstrable. You can't demonstrate the regularity of nature, for example. You can't demonstrate that things today are operating the same way they operated 11,000, 20,000, a million years ago, uh, which this whole system is built on. So these are all just presuppositions that they have no way to empirically verify. But the irony is that if, this all, if all of this is built on grand historical narratives, which have no empirical sense data proof, then the whole position is built on principles that cannot be demonstrated or proven. And all of these people are empiricists, right? Especially the basic bitch, you know, professional skeptics. They're all basic bitch empiricists. And they have no way to demonstrate or prove their first principles. But they don't care about that. And that's why they don't like philosophy is because philosophy asks those kinds of questions to demonstrate your first principles. And then we uh, say, you see... I'm not doing anything different than what you're doing in saying that all of the gods are false. I'm just saying one more, right? And he listed what Amun-Ra, Isis, all these different deities. But this is really just to presuppose that all the deities are in the same category as if they're all basically the same, right? Because a deity is something with no logical proof. It's just a bad explanation for agency behind the 
world which has no agency. But we're going to see that if the world has no agency behind it, then there's no telos, there's no purpose, and there's no way to have meaning or to obje- to have a reason to choose the true over the false, the good over the evil. Because if everything is just natural processes, then there is no good, there is no evil. There is just what is. And if there's just what is, then there's no reason for choosing what is the true over the false. In fact, there isn't really true or false. So this destroys the entire project of science, the entire project of math, the entire project of all the humanities. They all go down the drain. You can't do science, logic, math, any of these things anymore. Because those operate on principles that presuppose and logically entail other things. In other words, the true is necessarily connected to the good. And if there's no such thing as the true and the good, then there's no such thing as logic, debate, mathematics, and so forth. You can't do these sciences. They collapse. And and if you know the history of philosophy and modern epistemology, that's where it has gone. Right? It went in the direction of psychologism. It has adopted William Van Orman Quine's approach for the most part, which is to say that we don't do epistemology anymore. Because we, we realized that when we, when we tossed out metaphysics in the Enlightenment, and we thought, well, we'll just stick to studying the mind and epistemology. Oh, oops, now epistemology goes. Because you can't really do that. For many reasons, right? There's no access to the uh, external world. There's no access to this idea of objects in the world giving you uh, theory-neutral data. There's no knowledge of uh, invariant immaterial principles like numbers, abstract entities, etc. You don't have access to any of that because you've divorced metaphysics from philosophy. Guess what? Now, out with epistemology. So what are we doing now in philosophy? You're doing deconstructionism. You're doing postmodernism. You're doing um, what? Uh, uh, psychologism. That's all that's really left. There's nothing else to do, right? Oppression narratives, this kind of nonsense. That's really all that's left in philosophy. Why? Because philosophy as a discipline, I'm saying in the modern world, I'm not talking about philosophy proper, right? Philosophy proper is epistemology, metaphysics, ethics, right? Which is a, uh, a real classical pedagogical discipline. It is the queen of the sciences. It is the highest of the arts, and that's, that still exists, but it doesn't exist in the university system for the most part. Uh, that's all now brainwashing. So the reason, this is why people can't do philosophy. This is why thousands of people go and watch Sir Six videos and think they're owning the religionists and the Christians and the theists because they don't know anything about logic, philosophy, metaphysics, right? History, the things that they claim to be the you know rulers of right so let's get back to this but you see where you see how wait a minute so and this is all predicated on things that his belief system denies and makes impossible right probabilistic theories probably that's statistics statistics relies on math math doesn't work if you're an atheist now people the, the idiot atheist will say what do you mean? Like most mathematicians are atheists. He thinks that if you're atheist, you can't do math. <laughs> no, I'm saying work in the sense of giving an account for it, being consistent. I'm not saying you can't do math if you're an atheist. That's so. That's the level the people that we're dealing with. That's their objection to this. They don't even realize that. They don't even. They can't get the arguments that are being made. If you happen to be born in, say, the United States, States or England, or England or in the twentieth century. century there's a good chance that you believe that Yahweh is the all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe who manifested into flesh through Jesus of Nazareth. If you happen to have been born in India in the 20th century, there's a very good chance you're a Hindu who believes that Brahma is the unchanging, infinite, transcendent creator. So, but again, this has nothing to do with truth or falsehood, right? Because he's trying to reduce it to probabilism, but... Nowadays, uh, most people have been brought up in, you know, irreligious, atheistic type households, at least in the, the atheist West. So, but what does that have to do with the truth or falsity of any of these positions? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> I mean, it has nothing to do. It's like saying that uh, most people um, aren't brought up in households that have a 
clear notion of mathematics. So therefore, what are the chances that the few people that have been a, a, a worked out advanced theology of mathematics got it right? You see what I'm saying? So in other words, most of the world believes many wrong things from anybody, any, anyone's position. Let's say you're an atheist materialist and you look at the stats. Does most of the world have a coherent account or knowledge of advanced mathematics? No. So therefore, what are the chances? I'm going to use his dumb argument. So what are the chances that the few people that understand advanced mathematics got it right? So therefore, there's no reason, no consistent reason to really believe in advanced mathematical principles, etc. You see how dumb this are? It's just, it's just such a low tier. Um, it's a version of uh, appeal to the to the masses, right? Because he's he's it's like a combination of appeal to the masses and authority fallacy, right? It's literally like T jump level argument, like. Most atheists, uh, most, most professors are atheists, so your position's false because they're the experts. Like, are you that dumb? You can't recognize two basic informal fallacies of appeal to authority and appeal to the masses? I mean, th th he should know, right? But they don't. That these are pretty basic level fallacies. They, they have nothing to do with the truth or falsity of the positions in question. You could literally have 0.0001% of the population be correct about something and everyone else be wrong. So the stats have nothing to do with the truth or falsity of the position. Literally nothing. I mean, they can, they could potentially attest to the truth or falsity of some position. But they have nothing to do with the truth or falsity of the position ultimately. And we can reduce this to absurdity too, which is what happened in the T-Jump debate, right? Remember when T-Dump was, when he made this fallacy at the very beginning of the debate? And I pointed out that, well, on what basis do you know that we should we should follow the majority of the experts? He's like, just because we should, it's obvious. Uh, okay, and why is that? Reality is reality, bro. That's what he said. I mean, imagine, this is the level of people that we're dealing with. that They think that's a solid argument. So, I mean, I don't know how else, to, like two fallacies right away is what this argument is, is predicated on. And my example of most of the world not knowing math would be a perfect counter example to show that this is, this is a terrible argument. It doesn't prove anything. Literally has nothing. So let's rewind to a um, thousand years ago. A thousand years ago, most of the world was uh, some form of theist, right? Polytheist, Christian, Islam, right? Muslim, Judaism. So a thousand years ago, the probabilistic stats were that atheism is the most unlikely. I mean, this is, this is obviously such a dumb argument. How do the people at Oxford, these, look at this, that chunky Samwise Bieber sitting there. I mean, th did they not teach these people what fallacies are? D does nobody know what the appeal to masses fallacy is? Does nobody know what the appeal to authority fallacy is? I mean, it's like, how are these people Oxford trained tards, right? It's like, it's mind blowing. time and space and who manifests into flesh through Ganesha, the blue elephant god, who is the most worshipped divinity in India. To an anthropologist from Mars, these are all indistinguishable. Yeah, but they're not indistinguishable because these religions have completely different histories and completely different philosophies and completely different metaphysics. So the fact that you don't know those things and the fact that you're saying that they're all the same to me has nothing to do with the objective truth or falsity of those positions. So what he just gave there, what is that? That's a psychological description, right? That's a description of a psychological state. To me, they all look the same. So what? 
Do you remember Matt Dillahunty doing the exact same thing, right? Exact same thing. I can't see how this would be convincing. I don't see how. To me, these are all inco- it, literally no, nothing to do with the argumentation or truth or falsity. Nobody cares about what you do or do not find convincing. Those are psychologically descript- descriptive states. They're not arguments. I mean, imagine if I came to a debate and said, I find uh, atheism unconvincing. Uh, I have a friend who's a mathematician and he's an expert in math and he finds uh, he finds atheism unconvincing. And, and in fact, he polled most of the experts in math at his university and everybody who's a professor of mathematics at whatever university doesn't believe in atheism. Do you see the, nobody would buy that argument, but this is the argument that they're doing just the reverse. Now, let's say I did present a bunch of arguments that were objective arguments, right? Which is the transcendental argument is one of those, right? It is an objective, logical argument. And then I went to pointing out, hey, a lot of mathematicians also and engineers agree with me about there being principles like design, order, objective reality, etc. Would that be an appeal to authority fallacy? No, because I've already given my formal argument and then I'm just adding on, tacking on attestation, right? Here's some experts that agree and there's nothing wrong with doing that. But to come to the table and say, look, we all know we should follow the experts. The experts, they believe in Darwin. They don't believe in Christianity. The experts uh, say that religion is just an evolving thing. They're all the same. It's just a bunch of different gods. That's a fallacy, dummy. How can you not see? It's a basic fallacy. Do you see? And and why do we keep hammering this home? Because these goobers, they always come up to us. They always come on the discord. Totally arrogant, thinking that they own logic. They own reason, logic, rationality. They don't know basic fallacies. They can't do basic argumentation. 99% of them. So what we're trying to stress here is that do not let the atheist claim to have, to, to be the owners of reason and logic, right? You follow faith, I follow reason and logic. Exactly. Of course. There's... Yeah, he's about to put, is that Tim Dillon back there? Sharmer's about to put atheist Oxford Tim Dillon Bieber Samwise Gamgee to sleep back there. Do look at that. <laughs> that one wisp is like it's like gonna wrap it's like gonna wrap around his head. The big picture, they're all indistinguishable in that sense. Even within the three great Abrahamic religions, who can say which is the right one? Christians believe that Jesus is the Savior, and you must accept him. So again, this is another fallacy. The fact that people disagree has nothing to do with the truth or falsity of the position. I mean this should be obvious. This should, I shouldn't even, we shouldn't even have to, I mean, I think atheism is literally a thing for like, there's a, there's a certain IQ level where you just won't be an atheist if you're above that level. I I, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe I'm stretching it there, but like, because I know there's some really high IQ atheists or agnostics but it's not these people because th- this uh, this is it's not an argument and i hope everybody can say can see why that's not an argument right me coming to you and giving you psychologically descriptive narratives is not an argument and i i think it's because a lot of these people literally don't know what an argument is they don't know how to construct an argument they they don't know how to do critical thinking Hence why scripture says the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. Atheism is actually foolishness. It results in foolishness. It leads to foolishness. And that means in the discipline of philosophy, in the domain of epistemology, it will literally equal and equate to foolishness. It will be a self-contradicting mess. It's 
gibberish and nonsense. It can't make sense of anything. How does he understand that this is not an argument? I mean, I'm just I'm baffled here that that I mean Jews and Muslims disagree, so theism's not true. <laughs> what? <laughs> Talk about a non sequitur. I mean, this is just so dumb, dude. Like, and do you remember this is like the 2012 people were saying in the in the chat early on when before we got going live. This was in that 2012 phase when they, you know, YouTube was like atheism craze going wild and uh the banana butt atheist guy, what was his name? TJ Banana Butt, whatever his name was. Uh he was like, "Oh, a million followers, dude." And then he like turned into a goth guy. <laughs> it was then he suddenly he became white uh, like uh, Rob Zombie, like white zombie guy, and like he was all dressing up like Kiss, and everybody just laughed at him. It was total cringe. But that was all promoted, I think, on on, on purpose. That was all done intentionally. There was money. There was, uh, and we just covered that the the satanic Aeon guy, right, in that essay saying that back in the seventies and eighties, he was putting a lot of money into funding anything atheist, anything anti Christian as a Satanist. And I've had the theory for a long time that a lot of these uh, so-called uh, atheists are actually Luciferians, right? Uh, I don't know that for a fact, but just speculation. Um, definitely, it doesn't really matter because, I mean, Oxford University, these these entities are obviously objectively evil. I mean, they have the total uh, global elite worldview. They have the Depop worldview, Malthusian worldview, 100%. So, you know, at, whether they're atheists or Luciferians, or, or Satanists at the top level, it doesn't really matter because it's all the same worldview, basically. They all agree. But uh, here he is, you know, pontificating with literally some of the weak sauce, weakest arguments I've ever heard. I mean, this is this is down there with uh, Sam Harris level arguments. Remember how bad Sam Harris's arguments? They were all emotional appeals, which are fallacies, by the way. Again, the fact that if everybody in the world but five people was Muslim, atheist, Hindu, Jewish, right? And there was only five Christians, that would have nothing to do with the truth or falsity of the religions. Literally nothing to do with it. I mean, how does he not see this? Like, probabilistic statistics have nothing to do with the truth or falsity of a position. It's obvious. I mean, there was a time when... If we were to go get in a time machine and we were to ask, uh, you know, let's say, let's say we go back to um, a thousand years ago and we ask everybody, is the math behind computers correct? 99.9999% of the world's population would say, I don't know what you're talking about, and this sounds crazy. Computer, what? So it's a made-up thing. Yeah. So this has nothing to do with what's true or false, right? Because it doesn't matter if it was a thousand years ago. The mathematics and the principles behind how to build a computer were still true, even if nobody had knowledge or, or you know, cognizance of them, right? Because it's objective. It has nothing to do with how many people agree to it or not, right? So what happens is that the autonomous human mind thinks of itself in its fallen state as the arbiter of reality, right? And this is pre exemplified, especially in the atheist, right? The atheist thinks really it's just what man's mind determines to be the case that determines reality, that determines metaphysics, determines ethics, and that's why they appeal to these things like, well, it's whatever the majority of the experts say, which is literally so dumb. It's almost impossible. It's, it's almost not possible to respond to it. It's so dumb because it's hard to believe that that's what they're actually saying and arguing. Where Christians believe that the Bible is an inherent gospel handed down from the deity, Muslims believe the Quran is the perfect word of God. It's unfortunate that the creator of the universe wrote more than one holy book. 
Christians believe that Christ is the latest prophet. Muslims believe that Muhammad is the latest prophet. Mormons believe that Joseph Smith is the latest prophet. And stretching this track of thought just a little bit more, Scientologists believe that the science fiction writer L. Ron Hubbard was the latest prophet. So many prophets, so little time. Flood myths, very common throughout history. So again, this list that he gave is pure rhetoric, zero argument. L literally no argumentation there because he's just stretching out, filibustering his 15 minutes and has not presented uh, an argument. Now, I think we, I mean, at least in the last five minutes. Now, we could say his, um, it's not probable argument is an argument. Um, his analogy to cognitive science and intentional agents, you could say that's an argument. Um, they're not good arguments, but they're arguments. Government and religion evolved. Uh, you could say that's an argument. The fact that Jews and Christ Jews and Muslims disagree with Christians is not an argument. It's not an argument. It's not. Uh, it's fallacy. So some of these are you could say are arguments. They're they they're not they're non sequiturs. It doesn't follow. The argumentation is not solid. But they're at least arguments. But this is just that's just straight up fallacy. It's not an argument. Um, biographical accounts, psychological states are not arguments. I find it hard to believe. This doesn't matter. Who cares? That's a you problem, as Father Deacon always says. The fact that you find it hard to believe. I mean, we could find people in the world that find it hard to believe that there's two plus two equals four. Right? I find it hard to believe that two plus two. Okay, so what? <laughs> we don't care. Uh, this is the appeal to antiquity fallacy. Again, so Epic of Gilgamesh, which we don't even know that that's actually older. We're just gonna, let's say we grant that. I, I don't think that's proven. <laughs> I mean, nobody has actually proven that. It's just an assumption. Uh, again, wh where are the people in this audience of these Oxford dons? Right? We got Chunky Bieber over there uh, playing with his hair. We got, we got, you know, dude over there biting the crap out of his, his, his nails, his, his fingernails. And nobody has the wherewithal to say, Hey, uh, Dr. Sherm, Dr. Shrek, the, that's a fallacy. Uh, Gilgamesh epic is old. Therefore the Bible story of the flood is not true. Again, appeal to antiquity is a fallacy. Even if we granted that the Gilgamesh epic is older, has nothing to do with which one's true or false. I mean, imagine if I can't look. So people listen to this and they're mystified by this rhetoric and this storytelling. That's all this is, is rhetoric and storytelling. And But imagine if I came and I said, the Bible is old. The Bible is really old. So it's true. It's more probable that the Bible's true because it's older. <laughs> like what? Nobody would nobody would buy that argument. But he just made the equivalent of that type of argument that the Gilgamesh epic is older, so it's more reliable and more true, and therefore the Bible is an old a later account. Yeah, I mean, again, that's just presupposing that the Epic of Gilgamesh wasn't a ripoff of the Noah story. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter which one was written down, right? Because they both presuppose crazy dating methods. I mean, the Epic of Gilgamesh talks about, you know, kings being like 10,000 years old and, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. So, I mean, he's picking and choosing which things he thinks are accurate or uh, correct or earlier. And nobody actually knows that that's the case. It's just a theory. Virgin birth myths likewise spring up throughout time and geography. Among those alleged 
to have been conceived without the usual assistance of the male lineage. And by the way, in the traditions, this comes from your brother's book. Dionysus, Perseus, Buddha, Athos, Krishna, Horus, Mercury, Romulus, and of course, Jesus. Consider the parallels between Dionysus, the ancient Greek god of wine, and Jesus of Nazareth. Both were said to have been born from a virgin mother who was a mortal woman but were fathered by the king. So again, I mean, none of these arguments prove anything. The fact that other religions claim similar things has nothing to do with the truth or falsity of the religion in question. How does anybody not see this? I mean, that would be like, imagine if I said, if I said, uh, there's atheists who believe in leprechauns. There are lay atheists who believe in fantasy worlds. And I'm not joking. They are, there are right. All that multiverse nonsense. So I can literally list you, uh, let's say I list 10,000 atheists who believe in leprechauns. Uh, multiverse, quantum foam, all this bullshit that's all sci-fi stuff that's just me metaphysics for atheists, that's all it is, which is all like LARPy level nonsense, right? Dungeons and Dragons level shit, right? Which they actually believe in. I have Brian Greene's book on all the multiverse, right? <laughs> so I, I could literally repeat what he just said with more ridiculous stuff that... Thousands of atheists disagree and believe, disagree on and believe amongst them. Now, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That dis that proves that this is not a, a, a solid argument. It's a dumb argument. Heaven. And I mean, I know we have some slow boys in the audience, but do you guys understand that why what I just showed you is disproves his position? There's no audio for Shermer. Both allegedly returned from the dead, transformed water into wine, introduced the idea of eating and drinking the flesh and blood of the Creator, and to have been the liberator of mankind. Flood myths, not original to you. Virgin birth myths, not original to you. Resurrection myths, not original to you. Osiris is the Egyptian god of life. Death and fertility is one of the oldest gods for whom records have survived. Osiris first so it's a little echoey. Let's see if we can fix that echo. By which time his following was already well established. Widely worshipped until the compulsory repression of pagan religions in the early Christian era, Osiris was not only the redeemer and merciful judge, of the dead and the afterlife, he was also linked to fertility, most notably and appropriately to the geography, the flooding of the Nile. By the way, there is a, a geographical link between flood myths and bodies of water that flood. Not universal floods, just where you happen to live. The kings of Egypt themselves were inextricably connected with Osiris in death, such that when Osiris rose from the dead, so was they in union with him. By the time of the new kingdom, not only the pharaohs, but, but the, the mortal men, men and women who built, built the pyramids. pyramids. So here's what happened. The pharaohs figured out that if you offer eternal life for the workers, they'll work harder and you don't have to pay them as much. So Marx got that right from the few things he got right. The opiate of the masses. The masses don't need promises of an afterlife. They need sustenance now. This is a problem with religion. So that's where that comes from. First, you just want, as a pharaoh, king, a leader, you just want eternal life for yourself. Forget the people. Well, Got then it. you find I out they'll it. work harder, and they'll support you more if you give them some alms like, like eternal life. Shortly after the crucifixion of Jesus, there arose another Messiah, Apollonius of Asia Minor. Is that better? Whose followers claimed he was the son of God. Yeah. That he was able to walk through I got closed it now. doors, heal the sick, cast out demons, and raise a dead girl back to life. He was accused of witchcraft, sent to Rome before the court, was jailed, but escaped. After he died, his followers claimed he appeared to them and ascended into heaven. This um, redemption after being oppressed is a very common myth throughout history. And you can understand the cycle. Again, commonalities amongst the religions has nothing to do with, with truth or falsity. Uh, and again, I don't see how. So this is all predicated on his presupposition of his evolutionary comparative religion account of the origin of religion. So it's just presupposing the unbelief 
that goes into his position. And that's the thing that has not been demonstrated, right? That his position is true because these arguments all predicated on um, a bunch of principles that he can't demonstrate. And I don't think he's cognizant enough of philosophy and the discipline of philosophy to know the things that he ought to be able to demonstrate. So the argument then, the tag approach here, we'll go ahead and, uh, I mean, that's, well, it's only a few more minutes, so I'll play the rest of it. But um, we've seen that, um, I forgot to write down biographical account, but you get the point, right? Probabilism, uh, the appeal to uh, agency that uh, theists do, cognitive science appeals, the uh, grand historical narrative that he used, which is all based on non-empirical theories of history, which he can't demonstrate or prove. The idea of comparative religion uh, just being assumed in terms of this movement of history, which he has no knowledge of, that evolves to uh, produce some grand narrative story. He No way to demonstrate that. Uh, the assumption that all because there's a bunch of different positions, that the positions are all false. It has nothing to do with the truth or falsity of any of those positions. Um, that's literally a stupid level fallacy. Uh, Jews and Muslims disagree, so Christianity is not true. I mean, it's just like, what? <laughs> uh, appeal to antiquity. Some of these uh, claims are older. Nothing to do with the truth or falsity of any of them. So as we've seen so far, Shermer's done nothing but present fallacies. There's not been a, uh, one good argument yet. Theology behind it. The Native Americans in 1890 began a Messiah myth. He's literally just, just, just repeating this myth story thing like and look at all of these like into so-called intellectuals in this audience and i guarantee you nobody in that audience called out his fallacies maybe somebody did maybe the but. paiute indian Waboka, who received visions of god he was thought to be the messiah or the deliverer of the messiah in which the buffalo would all return the white man would leave and go back to europe and life would become better. Okay, so there's a bunch of crazy atheists who claim to have a bunch of belief in um, re ridiculous, uh, idiotic, quantum foam multiverse theories. So atheism's not true. That's the argument he's making, right? Do you see that? This is what oppressed people do. They make up stories that make them feel better. It's not being claimed that you can't prove a negative. Us atheists, we can't prove there is no God. Okay, I can prove that humans created gods and religions, and I just did. And, and there's there's 50 more stories like this of, of uh, the geographical location. Well, uh, nobody disputes what he says he just proved. So that wasn't even in dispute. But the topic of this debate is that God does not exist. So he's basically saying, because I showed that humans have invented gods, there is no God. That'd be like saying humans invent ideas, so there are no ideas. Humans make up math problems, so there are no math problems, right? I mean, it's a non sequitur. It's this is a stupid argument. It's just like, how does anybody not see through this dumb the, argument? The time you happen to have been born, the anthropology of religion, the psychology of religion, the sociology of religion. We we know exactly how this happens now, all the way down. Uh, we know we now know uh, that's one of the fallacies that uh, the new ones that Father Deacon and I think should be added to <laughs> the the we now know right we've we made fun of this the whole time in this whole series right we now know really who's we yeah exactly appeal to uh, academia again fallacy the neurology the neuroscience of it we know oh we we now know we now know we now know we now know these are all just appeals to authority. Appeal to the masses, appeal to tradition, appeal. I mean, it's a, I'm not saying that's appeal to tradition. That's appeal to authority and appeal to a, for, a form of appeal to the masses. Because the assumption is that it's a mix of the two because it's saying that we should follow the mass opinion of the experts. So it's a, it's a combination of two fallacies into a double fallacy. that people are making this up. Now, of course, you can make the argument, well, God planted the God module in the brain so we could talk to him or something. How come we all seem to talk to different gods? Are there just a bunch of them out there? And so this is straw man. Um, I don't know who his opponent is, if it's Hitchens or what, but um, who, who has actually ever argued this? 
Uh, maybe some theist has argued this, but this is a, a preposterous argument. Oh, God put a God module in our head so that we could talk to God, so that God exists. Uh, again, straw man, <laughs> stupid argument, right? I mean, and I hope you guys know what straw man is, right? It's just make up some dumb argument that your position, your, your opponent's position isn't saying. And then when you knock down the straw man, aha, you see, I've refuted. When nobody made that, I've never heard that. I mean, I'm sure there is some dumb theist somewhere who makes that level of a dumb argument. But I've never heard that argument. God put a God module in our head so that we could talk to God. What? It's feeding for our brains. Why is it, uh, as, as Dan Barker pointed out, there's very little agreement amongst believers. Why is that? So that again, irrelevant to the truth or falsity of a position. Uh, how, how are the atheists this dumb that they think that numbers of agreement or disagreement, like percentiles, have something to do with the truth or falsity? If 99.9% .9 of the world decided tomorrow that 2 plus 2 is not 4, would that have anything to do with whether 2 plus 2 equals 4? I mean, this is so stupid. Conclusion then is that, as you think about the House vote tonight, again, what's more likely? It's obvious that all these other gods... It's obvious that... Yeah, you already know that. You agree with me on that. So, again, the assumption is that all the positions are the same because they have similarities, and so they're all the same. Uh, that's the parts whole fallacy. The fact that uh, there's, the fact that some uh, of the the world religions have this or that does not mean that they're all the same. They're all atheists for all those other gods. So I would just implore you to go one. God further. Thank you. Anyway, so that was terrible. I mean, that was just literally, uh, as is always the case, just a collection of fallacies. So I don't know how uh, far we'll get in this one, but just to rehash what we saw there was pretty weak sauce. We had, right, recoup here. We had, uh, it's not probable that God exists. We had that predators and, and intentional agency. So we assume that there's intentional agency because we were set upon by predators. Um, not the predator, but predators. Get to the chapel! We know from more cognitive science that the human brain evolves to do certain things. And the invisible uh, sky god is just assumed to be there because of cognitive evolutionary science and the way that the infant brain patterns itself to believe in sky daddies. Then we saw that the grand historical narrative shows us that all of humanity uh, evolved in the same way that an infant evolves. And so there's this parallel, which he doesn't understand is like a huge metaphysical assumption Right, which is Darwinists have always done this with their homologies, right? Where they say, "Oh, look, here's a zygote. Uh, it looks kind of like, like something floating in water. So it's like the way that like tadpoles, like the way tadpoles developed in our evolutionary tree, is like the way that a baby zygote. That's like the same. And then uh, it turns out Ernst Haeckel was making all that up, right? He forged all these stupid drawings to try to prove that stupid position, uh, ontogeny, right? And he was oh. Turns out he was a fraud. Um, then he lists a bunch of gods. And since the gods all disagree, they must all be wrong. Uh, and so, again, I think it's a parts whole fallacy to reason from the fact that there's differences, then they're all false. Like it's a version of that. And also, uh, it's a the fact that he finds it uh, unbelievable is irrelevant. And then there was appeal to antiquity. So next we will get into this one. I don't know if we'll get all the way through this one, but uh, we'll give it a shot. See how far we get. Welcome everybody. We are doing, that was 2012 Michael Shermer. Uh, we better get going or we'll never get, get anywhere, but I don't know what, where this one's going to go, but let's get into it.
Can you all hear that one? Welcome, Father Deacon. Um, Father Deacon's in the chat, and since he's here, we could ask him. Let's see if we think that this is a valid reading. So, if I'm going to turn it up, I, I'm trying my best to make these other things, these other. Uh, I'm going to pull that one. I'll put that one all the way up because it's pretty low. So, hopefully, that'll work. Um. So let, let's think uh, in summation there, that end of Hitchens, uh, not Hitchens, Shermer's argument was that all of the religions disagree. And since this one disagrees with that one and that one disagrees with that one and that one disagrees with that one, right? If these are false, then they must all be false. What is the composition fallacy, right? Let's read this summary. Informal fallacy, which arises when one infers that something is true of the whole from the fact that it is true of some of the parts. By You could also say if the parts are false, then the whole is false, right? It would be another version of that. No atoms are alive. Therefore, nothing made of atoms is alive. See? The religions all disagree, therefore every religion is false. Many, 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 many things disagree. The totality is therefore false. Yeah, that's the parts whole fallacy. Is that, would you agree with that reading, Father Deacon, if you are there? Shout out, Father Deacon. Call in, Father Deacon. Come to the rescue, Father Deacon. Boom, boom, boom. Shout out, Father Deacon. Sounds like a Southern Gospel song. Step into the water, wait out a little bit deeper. Join the angels singing praises to the Lamb of God. Boom, 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 step into the water. Shout out, Father Deacon, help us with the logic. I know that was really dumb, but is that right, Father Deacon? Are you there? Fallacy of division? Okay, so the reverse taking the revenge of arranging for English weather. Is that better? To greet me. I've got... Now, I could... I've been given 15 I've minutes got to Hitchens up as loud as it'll go. Do it Is that loud enough? Two, um, like this, as a proposition. When Gertrude Stein was dying, some of you will know this story, she asked, as her last hour approached, well, what is the answer? And when no one around her bed spoke, she rephrased and said, well, in that case, what is the question? And I'm speaking tonight, we are speaking tonight, we're met tonight um, at an institution of higher learning. And the greatest obligation that you have is to keep an open mind and to realize that in our present state, human society, we're more and more overborne by how little we know. Yes, uh, that's correct. It's fallacy of division. Fallacy of division is an informal fallacy that occurs when one reasons that something is true for a whole must also be true for all of its parts. No, but see, that's not... It was the other route that Shermer was taking it. Since all of the religions are disagreeing, therefore, the totality of religions, including Christianity, must be false. And how little we know about more and more, or if you like, how much more we know, but how much less we know as we find out how much more and more there is to know. In these circumstances, which I believe to be undeniable, so, the only respectable intellectual position is one of doubt 
I've got Hitchens up all the way. Reservation and pre, and I'd stress pre and unfettered inquiry in that lies as it has always lain, our only hope. So you should beware always of those who say. This is a, itself a low audio decided. video. In particular, to those who tell you that they've been decided by reservation, excuse me, by revelation, uh, that, they've, that, they're, that there are handed down commandments and precepts that predate, in a sense, ourselves, and that the answers are already available if only we could see them, and that the obligation upon ourselves to debate ethical and moral and historical and other questions is thereby dissolved. It seems to me that that is the one position, it's what I call the faith position, that has to be discarded first. So, thank you for your attention, and I'm done. Except that, it seems, that I have a reputation for demagogy to uh, live up to. <laughs> when I come to a place like this, I read the local paper, um, the Campus Observer in this case, and I was sorry to see that Dinesh and I are not considered up to the standards of Father Richard McBriar, um, whose exacting uh, standards I, I dare say are out of our reach. And I was also sorry to see myself and others represented in other papers, um, and in particular by um, a distinguished cleric in St. Peter's on Good Friday, who made a speech through which His Holiness the Pope sat in silence, Father Cantillon Mesa, saying that people like myself are part of a pogrom, a persecution comparable only to that of the Jews, uh, with the church in mind. This is the first time I've ever been accused of being part of a pogrom or a persecution. But as long as it's going on, I'll also add that it's the only pogrom I've ever heard of that's led by small deaf and dumb children whose cries for justice have been ignored. And while that is the definition of a pogrom, I'll continue to support it because I think it demonstrates very clearly the moral superiority of the secular concept of justice and law over canon law and religious law with its particular emphasis on self-exculpation in the guise of forgiveness and redemption. That's not the only reason why religion is a problem. It's a problem principally because it is man-made, because to an extent it is true, as the church used to preach when it had more confidence, that we are, in some sense, originally sinful and guilty. If you want to prove that, you only have to look at the many religions that people have constructed to see that they are indeed the product of an imperfectly evolved primate species, about half a chromosome away from a chimpanzee, so here we have similar moves that we just saw with Shermer. The assumption of evolutionary psychology is really the only way to account for religion. And that they're all just sort of based on appeals to revelation, right? And he says it's just this sort of primitive way of looking at the world. So let's start with that. Uh, Evolutionary psychology is the first argument. Primitive man seems to be where he's going first. An adrenaline gland that's too big and various other evolutionary deformities about which we're finding out ever more. The species that is predatory, man is a wolf to man, homo homini lupus, as has well been said. A species that's very fearful of itself and others and of the natural order. And above all, very, very willing, despite its protestations of religious modesty, to be convinced that the operations of the cosmos and the universe are all operating with us in mind. Uh, make up your mind whether you want to be modest or not. Yeah, but was my mullet predestined? Or did I choose to get my mullet. But don't say that you were made out of dust or if you're a woman out of a bit of rib or if you're a Muslim out of a clot of blood and you're an abject sinner born into guilt. But add, nonetheless, let's cheer up. The whole universe is still designed with you in mind. <laughs> Man-made false consolation in my judgment. And it does great moral damage. Monkey mullet. Begins by warping what we might call our moral sense 
Monk it. It's a monk it. Um, I wish that was all that could be said, though I think that's the most uh, important thing. I was, of course, was predestined. I was predestined and predetermined to have mullet. I was, of course, predetermined. Predetermined. Predetermined to have the mullet. Religion was our first attempt to make sense of our surroundings. Our first attempt at cosmology, for example, to make sense of what goes on in the heavens. It was our first attempt at what I care about the most, the study of literature and literary criticism. It, it gave us texts to deliberate and even to debate about, even if some of those texts were held to be... Well, uh, by the way, so remember, here we get the list of the goods of course religion has done some good things the good really you sure you want to go that route <laughs> the good because to say that there are good things is to assume the good i'm really interested to hear what christopher thinks is the good because remember there's no metaphysics in these kinds of systems or these positions. So when they give these arguments for, uh, or the rhetoric that he's doing right now to say, well, religion's done some good, you know, it kind of like, it was the early t uh, attempt at science and explaining the world. And so they just thought it was these sky daddy, you know, entities, whatever. But uh, no, actually it's, uh, you know, just kind of like primitive literature and science. That's it. So it did give us some cool things and some good books, you know, some good reading and stories. And I love literature because these are good things. The good? There's no such thing as the good in atheism. Literally, I hope that atheists get this. There is no good. There's no good. There's no evil. There's just what is. And everything that is just is. Okay. The good, that's in the domain of metaphysics and ethics. Aesthetic judgments doesn't exist because in atheism by default all of those things are purely subjective purely taste driven that's just your subjective taste there's no such thing as the good it's just the good to you right seven coconuts seven bananas seven monkeys in my pajamas <laughs> seven coconuts Seven pajamas, seven monkeys in my pajamas, dude. That's my argument right now. You just got refuted. The word of God and beyond review, beyond criticism, nonetheless the idea is introduced and it had never been introduced before. Um, it's our first attempt at healthcare in one way. If you, if the Sorry, so again, uh, this is the good, right? It's an attempt at healthcare. Um, I don't know why we should attempt healthcare in a nihilistic, empty, moral, relativist universe. There's no such thing as health. <laughs> There's just what is, right? Health presupposes good health, bad health, good, bad, value judgments. There's no such thing as value judgments in this goober worldview. You go to the shaman or the witch doctor uh, when you make the right propitiations, the right sacrifices, and you really believe in it, you do have a better chance of recovery. Everybody knows. Morale is an ingredient uh, in health. And it was our first attempt at that, too. It was our first very bad attempt at human service. So, morale and mental attitude is a fact that it will actually heal you even if you believe in false things. So, by his own reasoning, then, if religion is producing good things, we should believe in it. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, in other words, unless he wants to say that we shouldn't believe in false things, which is an ought you see, then he would refute himself. So now he's making ought statements and what we ought to do. There's no oughts in your worldview, dude. No such thing as an ought. Actually, because it was tribe-based, uh, but nonetheless, it taught that there were virtues in sticking together. And it was our first attempt, I would say, also, this is not an exhaustive list, of psychiatric care, at dealing with the terrible loneliness of the human condition. Uh, what happens when the individual... Well, sorry, dude, nothing wrong with feeling lonely. Nothing wrong with feeling like nothing in a nothing universe. It's just what is. Isn't that part of the evolutionary process to realize your nothingness? 
that's what the atheists claim, right? That they're the most enlightened because they realize that reality of the world, life is meaningless. And they're uh, bold enough to, you know, step up to the plate and admit that to themselves. And that's what makes them superior to all of us stupid theists, all of us childish, uh, you know, simps in the world of religion. Uh, we're just not the, you know, we don't have the balls of the atheist. But wait a minute. That is a, an emotional appeal, first of all. Uh, right. We've seen this in multiple atheists. They make the emotional appeal argument that, oh, you need religion because of a crutch, because you're a weak person. And so I understand, Mr. Weak Man, that you need a crutch, but you're not as intellectually robust as us atheists. We're better than you. Really? Better? Oh, doesn't exist. That's value judgments. So literally, they can't make sentences. They can't talk, dude. They don't understand that when they talk, they refute their position. Literally, because sentences require objective principles, metaphysics, and truths. Spirit looks out shivering into the enormous void of the cosmos and contemplates its own extinction and deals with the awful fear of death. This oh, but wait a minute. Uh, the extinction of humanity, loneliness, emptiness, is just what is. It's not bad. It's not good. You may not like it, but that's irrelevant. Nobody cares in a debate what people like or don't like. Do you see why these, again, imagine if I come to the debate and I say, I don't like atheism. I find it unconvincing. What's the first thing an atheist is going to say? Oh, we got you, dude. We got you. That's a fallacy. Nobody cares what you like or don't like, dude. Oh, but wait, that's every atheist's stupid argument, isn't it? That's every atheist comes up to the podium and makes the same dumb arguments like this. The universe is literally a giant pile of nothing. And you're emerging out of nothing and going back into nothing. So guess what? That means your life is nothing. Uh-oh, that means your arguments are nothing. Exactly. So if you really want to bite the bullet... You can't debate. You can't go up to the podium because you can't make sentences because there is no meaning. Sentences presuppose meaning. The first attempt to apply any bomb to that awful question. But as Charles Darwin says of our own evident kinship with lower mammals and lower forms of life, we bear, as he puts it in the Origin of Species, we, we, we bear always the ineffaceable stamp of our lowly origin. I repeat it, the ineffaceable stamp of our lowly origin. Religion does the same thing. It quite clearly shows that it's the first, the most primitive, the most crude, and the most deluded attempt to make sense. Uh, have you noticed the assumption of a metaphysical gradation and scale that the atheists and the evolutionists always uh, work into their argumentation? They assume a gradation and a scale based on values. Lower primitive forms, higher complex forms. Guess what? That doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a metaphysical gradation of lower, which is a presupposing that that's a lesser place you don't want to be. Somehow ignominious, a, a non-dignified status, right? Monkey man. My life have value because monkey have value. Remember the famous... Uh, stellar argument of Matt Dillahunty. Uh, my, my life have, has value because I, I'm, I'm a monkey decided to have value. Monkey have value. What? That's that's the level of these people, dude. Remember the Bible says that they actually become the idols that they worship. They turn into their idols. So these people think they're monkeys. They end up with monkey level arguments and logic. My life have value because monkey had value. That's literally what Matt Del Hunty said. What? And you have an audience? People listen to you? Wow. Worst attempt, but partly because it was the first. So the credit can be divided in that way. And the worst thing it did was to offer us certainty, to say these are truths that are, are unalterable, they're handed down from on high. We only have to learn God's will and how to obey it in order to free ourselves from these 
dilemmas. That's probably the worst advice of all. Heinrich Heine says that if you're in a dark wood on a dark night and you don't know where you are and you've, ne you've never been through this territory before, you may be well advised to hire as a guide the local mad, blind old man who can feel his way through the forest. <laughs> but when the dawn breaks and the light comes, you would be silly if you continue to operate with this guy, this blind, mad old man who was doing his best with the first attempt. Okay, so again, we see the analogy to listening to religion is like listening to a blind, dumb, goober, crazy old man, the old prospector trying to make sense of reality. And now that the dawn has come, the enlightened reason-based atheists are here to guide us into a better future. Oh, wait a minute. So better, worst, true, false, value, judgments, objective reality. Again, going back to all this stuff that he needs for his argumentation. He needs value judgments. He needs truth and falsehood. He needs the good and the bad to do apologetics and argumentation against Christianity. But his position is predicated on there being none of those things. Those things are impossible in this worldview and paradigm. So he must use the things that Christianity gives an account for that can only make sense in a Christian paradigm. Logic, truth, Value judgments, aesthetics, metaphysics, right? Objective reality, true and false. It's that simple that this worldview is nonsense. It is stupid. It is basic fallacy, contradiction, incoherency. come because the Jews have poisoned the wells, as the church very often preached, or that the Jews even exist and are themselves a plague, as the church used to preach when it felt strong enough, and also was morally weak enough and had such little evidence. <laughs> so the argument here is that the church is opposed to Jews because of the weakness of Christianity in the church. I mean, again, this is just basic biblical ignorance. I mean, you can read Romans 11, where Paul says in his day, the existence of the Jews actually is a proof of the of the Bible in the Old Testament, right? The fact that they are still here as a people, as a religion, is actually an attestation to the reality of the Old Testament religion, right? So, and I, I, he maybe he's talking about the medieval papacy with, with this, like, social justice level argument that he's making. But, uh, yeah, this is all directed at, like, papal corruption. Okay, maybe, but, like, how does any of that prove or disprove... Christianity. So this is like a, this is another version of emotional appeal where it's, remember when Sam Harris was doing the, uh, don't you feel bad for the religion? There's somewhere in the world right now, there's a poor child being persecuted by a religionist. Therefore, religion, bad. Okay, that's an emotional appeal. And by the way, in your worldview, there is no, bad or good so it doesn't even work <laughs> uh, you can free yourself it's just rhetoric if you study plate tectonics you won't do what the archbishop of haiti did the other day speaking to his sorrowing people after his predecessors had been buried in the ruins of the cathedral of port au prince along with a quarter of a million other so this is a uh, an interesting line of argument because it's similar to what we saw with um Shermer, which is that, well, we used to think that plagues are chastisements and punishments, but because we realized that there's other factors involved in plagues like germs, now we know that it's completely random, non-intentional, non-purposive, and has no purpose. So he actually thinks that by removing telos, like at a grand scale, divine providence, that now we have a better explanation, which is that it's just evolutionary psychology, biology, processes, blind processes. Oh, but wait a minute. Blind processes don't allow you to have the ability to make argumentation. Now there's no difference or distinction between choosing the bad, 
and choosing the good because it's all blind processes. In fact, your own argumentation is just the product of blind processes, chemical reactions. Your thought process is just chemical reactions, blind process. There's no difference in your thought process between the true and the false. They just are thought processes because they just are chemical reactions. So he doesn't realize that by removing purpose, telos, purposiveness, intentionality, even from natural disasters, he's removed it in the totality. It's also another form of composition fallacy because he's saying that because we didn't in the past see the elements of diseases or plagues in part that therefore or that because it appears in some instances that plagues or diseases are unintentional or non-caused or have no purpose that everything has no purpose you see that's another composition fallacy it's just another version of that same fallacy oh uh i don't see a purpose here i don't see a purpose here therefore there's no purpose Oh, but wait a minute. If there's no purpose in the totality perspective, in, in terms of ultimate reality, then your arguments now lose all purpose and meaning. And life has no purpose and meaning, which is what these people always tout. But they don't even realize that that destroys the possibility of making an argument. There's nothing wrong with lives being miserable. He keeps making this argument that we ought to alleviate. It's assuming that we ought to alleviate lives that are miserable. Why? It's just blind processes. There's no. There's nothing better to a life of misery versus a life of pleasure and non-misery. They're literally equalized in his worldview. So all of this is just bloviating and pontificating about things that he can't give an account for and all it just amounts to baseless rhetoric. Literally no argumentation and only baseless rhetoric. I'm trying to think of how to word this. The fact that we have learned plate tectonics and the fact that we understand that angle or element of natural disasters and events it does not follow from that that there is no purpose in the totality scheme and that's what he's doing that's a fallacy it's a parts whole fallacy how could it not be The great. <laughs> used to say rather leniently, I think, that well, these are non-overlapping magisterial and material world, the scientific world and the faith world. I think non-overlapping. Is right. So uh, somebody says, well, what if we said he's uh, he's just determined through blind chemical processes to believe that pleasure is preferable to pain? So what? None of those is better than the other. You can't make a value judgment. Because everything has been reduced to pure subjective preferences, right? That's just what you find palatable. So it has nothing to do with, there's no ought, right? This is just Hume's point. The fact that everything just is, you can never get an ought from an is. And every one of these atheists, it's like, have they never read David Hume? I mean, I wish they would, because they would be more consistent and realize that, oh, actually, I have to actually now give up my bloviating and pontificating about morals and my moral superiority because there are no morals you're not morally superior in a universe with no morals but they'll literally sit there and say the universe does not entail any morality and then pontificate that they're morally superior yeah that doesn't work dude so atheism is morally superior but there's also no morals by the way literally that's what he's saying Atheism is morally superior. I'm morally superior to you religionists. By the way, there's no morals because we're all predetermined robots in a giant machine universe. I mean, this is just so stupid. I mean, does no where does nobody call these people out on these stupid fallacies that they're and they're making basic, idiotic level, childish level fallacies and arguments 
And it's like the emperor has no clothes. The whole world props these people up with like millions of views. Look at this. Five million views. People, millions of people think that this guy is solid argumentation. How many? 25,000 thumbs up. Now, maybe they like it because they also like Dinesh's debate. I don't know. Just we'll see. I don't know what D Dinesh is going to do. We'll see. I'm a, I'm, my assumption is it's going to be basic bitch, boring, evidentialism, bad arguments. And I want you to notice this. Notice this. Do you think... D Dinesh will come to the table and call out any of these dumb fallacies. I, I'm betting he won't. I'm going to bet he doesn't. Which it's like, wouldn't that be Apologetics 101 to call out the fallacies here? My timer, by the way, isn't running, so I'm under your discipline. But, um, you'll give me... Very good. Um, Has he even made an argument? I mean, I've, list, I've listed several things here. I'm not... He's increasing. It was thought until... These are uh, super weak sauce, dude. My big bang. That's that's really where he's gonna go. Uh oh. Why ask why there's something rather than nothing when you can see the nothingness coming? Only replaces the question. Faith is of no use in deciding it. And that's you can see the nothingness coming. So. The atheists literally think that, which they have no proof for, right? He thinks that the galaxies are coming towards us to blow us up, right? Just like weird. It's like a materialist version of the second coming. <laughs> the Andromeda galaxy is coming. There will be a coming. The second coming of the Andromeda galaxy to annihilate us. The nothing is the nothing, dude. Never ending story. His worldview is literally never ending story shit. Michael Enda, the never-ending story. Ah, look around. Atheism's what you see. Christopher Hitchens, he's greasy face, greasy. Greasy little Hitchens. Never-ending nothing, the never-ending nothing. Ah, 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 ah. Look how greasy he is. They get a haircut, man. A greasy ass slob. The slobby ass hair dripping over his face. Look like a bloated carbohydrate slob over there. There's nothing. The nothing is clean. I have watched the never ending story. The never ending story. The never ending story. I'm spurging. I'm spurging out. He literally just appealed to a never-ending story argument. The nothing is coming to get us. The nothing. And so, therefore, there's no God because God designed a universe where the nothing is coming. <laughs> Remember the never-ending story song? There's a greasy Chris Hitchens. Who's bloviating now? The never ending story. Oh, the never ending story. Oh, there's a greasy Hitchens who's scratching at his lice. <laughs> I don't know. It just looks so gross there. Branches of our own family, of sapiens, branches of it, the Cro Magnons. Yeah, so here we go. Appeal to a bunch of non empirical uh, aeons ago bullshit, right? They love this, right? Well, you know, that one million aeons ago, there was a Geico caveman, and the Geico caveman is no longer with us, and so therefore, no God, because God designed Geico cavemen. I mean, again, all presupposing his dumb position 
which is not even true. I don't believe there's any Geico cavemen. Like, Geico cavemen are as real as the Geico cavemen ads. They're just made up. And how do we, oh, guess what? Piltdown man, Nebraska man, they're frauds. They're all frauds. And we know they're frauds. So, wait a minute. So, Darwinism, atheism, built on fraud archaeology? Yeah, exactly. Uh, the Neanderthals, who were living with us until about 50,000 years ago, who had tools. What is the empirical uh, evidence and proof for what happened 50,000 years ago? Oh, there's not any at all. Who made art, who decorated graves, uh, who clearly had a religion, who must have had a god, who must have abandoned them, who must have let them go. They're no longer with us. We don't know what The Geico caveman argument. We call this, we're going to call this the Geico caveman argument, right? Because there was, the Geico cavemen are dead. God abandoned them. So therefore, there's no telos. There's no design. <laughs> that's, what, that's what he's arguing. Jesus was down to about 10,000 in Africa before we finally... It well, began in Africa. That's the Chemical Brothers. To move from the macro, in other words, to the micro. Our own solar system is only halfway through it. Oh, wow. So he's saying that if there's no design in the micro, I'll just expand that to the macro. There's no design in the universe. Well, again, the interpretive, the interpretation of the micro to say that there's no design and then to expand that to the macro that therefore there's no design is parts whole fallacy. <laughs> so again, they keep doing this. Yes, Neanderthals are fake. Look up Piltdown Man. Look up, look up Nebraska Man. Famous famous forgery, famous frauds. And it just so happens that Teilhard de Chardin, another famous fraudster quack, oh, he just happens to appear at most of these frauds. Well, I wonder what's going on. The, the evangelist for evolution just magically appears at famous frauds. I wonder what's going on. No, he's back to the never-ending, the, the, the nothing argument, the never-ending story argument. Greasy Chrissy Hitchens, he's making fallacies, the never-ending fallacy. Here we go, a bunch of sci-fi bullshit about champagne supernovas. Dude, I'll listen to, I will believe Noel Gallagher over you talking about Champagne Supernova, but you don't know nothing about Supernova. It's all bullshit, dude. Can you be brought to believe that the main events in human history, the crucial ones, happened 3,000 to 2,000 years ago in illiterate desert Arabia and Palestine? And that it was at that moment. Um, they weren't illiterate. Uh, what? Illiterate Arabia desert palestine jews weren't illiterate <laughs> what are you talking about just is just dumb like that the most important events happened two three thousand years ago okay mosaic law if it's written down it they weren't illiterate they wrote it down dummy I mean, it's like what Uh, yes. So here we go. He, he knows that people are going to go to this argument, right? That he doesn't have a basis or no, no, he notice what he said there. A source source. Well, I'm sure he thinks he's the source for his ethics and morality, right? His humanitarian humanist reasoning, which of course is nothing. It all falls apart, has no basis. So this is, uh, uh, this is an important point that we've seen atheists do all the time. And they do it in the Discord, too. When they come to the Discord, they do the exact same thing. They confuse a story with giving an account for. Pay attention to that. Giving an account for something in an epistemic justificatory sense 
is not the same thing as you telling a story. Because this is what the atheists always do. They say, oh, how do you give an account for morals? They think that means tell me a story about how morals evolved. No, dude, not asking for a story. I don't care about your psychological processes. I don't care about your, uh, the story that you think accounts for morals evolving. I want you to give an account in, ter- in terms of epistemology of your belief, a justified true belief in morals. Two totally different things. And literally 99.9% of the atheists make this stupid move to say, oh, my account for morals is that we just evolved to adopt these agreed upon principles for survival. That is not an epistemological account. That is a story. That is not what I asked for. I asked for an account and you can't do that. So he just did the same thing because I guarantee you what he's going to say is, we're not asking you for your source of morals. He says that I have no source for morals. How dare you ask? How dare you say I have no source for morals? No, not a source, an account. Justified, true belief, account. Pile the insulting onto the irrational and tell me that if I don't accept these sacrifices. Well, by the way, uh, what's wrong with being insulting? <laughs> I mean, you're an atheist. There's nothing wrong with being insulting. So you may not like it, but we don't care what you like and don't like. Right? Imagine a Christian coming to this debate and saying, I don't like. I don't like you. I don't like your arguments. What would an atheist say? We don't care. Get out of here. Nobody gives a shit what you like or dislike. That's not an argument. In the desert, I have no reason to tell right from wrong. One minute. One minute. By the way, uh, this rhetorical thing about being from the desert, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> like, I mean, I mean, I could, I could, in a, if I wanted to be a woke SJW, I could be like. Oh, anti-Arab, right? I could read that as an anti-Arab thing, right? Which he would like cower from. I'm not trying to be anti-Arab. Which again, what? there's nothing wrong or right. There's nothing good or bad. So it's literally all rhetoric. Um. <clears throat> What's happening? He's, he's a short circuiting. Settlers are stealing other people's land in the hope of bringing on the Messiah and a terrible war. On the alternative side, as it thinks of itself, the Islamic jihadists are preparing a war without end, a faith based war based on the repulsive tactic of suicide murder. And all of these people believe that they have a divine warrant. Oh, wait a minute. The repulsive tactic of S U I C I D E B O M B I N G. Do we all see the problem here? How dumb this is. Nobody cares what you personally find repulsive, dude. It has nothing to do with what's true or false or what's wrong and right. Okay, so you're at a debate. Debates presuppose logic, (laughs) argumentation. You can't commit fallacies in debates. I mean, I don't know how. It's not that difficult. If I come to the chessboard and I put my checkers pieces down on the chessboard and I take my checker piece and I say, I knock over your king and I say, ha ha, I won. Uh, 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 I won the game of chess because my checker piece knocked over your king. Everybody would be like, you're insane. You're not playing chess. Uh, there's no rules, dude. <laughs> what? This That's what they're doing in a debate. That's the equivalent of the atheist debate is a crazy man, slow boy, bringing his checker pieces to the chessboard and like throwing them at the chessboard, right? And then when when the checker pieces knock over the king and the queen, he declares victory. And you're like, you're not even playing the game. You're doing something else. <laughs> like you're acting like a Spurgatron, right? And then they're like, there's no rules. There's no laws. And I just beat you at the the game that has rules and laws. 
That's what the atheist is doing. The atheist is literally saying, there's no rules and no laws. And let me use the rules and laws to show you there's no rules and laws. And I won. That's how dumb this is. Atheists are like beautiful slow boys that are playing chess or checkers and they smash the board and the pieces fly everywhere and then claim that they won. That's literally what every atheist debate is to me. That's literally what I see. That's all I see. I see slow boys like just smashing checker boards and chess boards and like screaming, screeching, squelching about how they won. Yeah! That's what they did. That's all they have. That's what these people are doing. They're, and they're all the same. Every one of the debates is the same. This is this debate has not changed. This dumb debate has not changed in since the 1700s. Oh. I'm getting like Alex level like mad about how dumb this is. Imagine the same stupid ass debate for 400 years. It goes back to 1600s, dude. And the arguments of this, they were debating that Telos doesn't exist in the Enlightenment. It's the same dumb ass debate. It's, it's not even a debate. It's like I'm hearing two car salesmen selling the same pieces of crap cars for the thousandth time. And it's like, people are like, do you ever hear really strong, challenging atheist arguments? And I'm like, have you ever heard a used car salesman give you a really good line about why you need to buy that piece of crap? No, because it's always the same. They're literally limited to like the same. It's almost like a handful. Like you could literally, I could literally right now just write up a, a, like an algorithm. I mean, I can't, but somebody should make one of those generators, like the atheist argument generator, because they're all the same. There's only five of them. It's like five emotional appeal, parts, whole fallacy, uh, appeal to antiquity, appeal to uh, Mameen God. Um, that's, I mean, that's about it. That's the, all, they're all about that. And treaty. Meanwhile, in Russia, the authoritarian, chauvinistic, expansionist group. What? Russia's authoritarian, chauvinist, expansionist government? Are you serious? Is this guy just a front for British intelligence? He literally ties in, like, Putin to this argument? <laughs> what? By the way, what is wrong with misogyny and chauvinism in your dumb atheist paradigm i mean that dude what this is like the most cucky social justice terrible presentation i've ever heard oh so now the russian orthodox church oh he's thrown that in there well at least as an atheist luciferian idiot i'll give him credit for figuring out who his actual enemies are right so at least he perceives that the Russian Orthodox Church is actually like one of the things that is the big problem here for him. Exactly. So he gets one point for being that perceptive to throw in um, uh, some Russia gate nonsense, which, what was it, 2010? Wow. So he was like way ahead of the game, uh, probably repeating. I more more think that this is probably like, you know, is this is he at Oxford or Cambridge? Is that where this debate is? I don't know. No, it was Notre Dame. Might as well be. It's all the same. Uh, Western power structure gibberish nonsense. There you go. Rokor. He went after he went after the Russian church. Wow. Of all the things to throw in, like this, this goober, this, he looks like a frog, dude, right? This frog emerged from the pit to like an evil Pepe to call out the Russian Orthodox Church. Wow. And Iran. And Israel. And Saudi Arabia. And I would call that a reduction out of seven. And I'll leave you with it. And I'll be back. Thanks. 
It's really sad. I mean, it would be nice if I think there's maybe a couple. There's I've really only ever heard a couple atheists that actually may. And now there's probably atheist professors that do this, but they're just not in the public sphere of like being known, well known. So aside from obscure professors, do these people's arguments are just pathetic. They're piss poor. They're, they're not arguing. And that's the thing is that. I feel sorry for a lot of the audiences because audiences aren't convinced by logic. They're actually, unfortunately, convinced by rhetoric. And that's just the way of the world, obviously, right? All right, so I don't know what uh, we're going to get with this Dinesh, but I do not have high hopes. Uh, and I'm expecting the worst. I'm going to expect the worst so that hopefully I will be pleasantly surprised. So uh, we know we're not going to get, like... He's not going to call out fallacies, I guarantee you. Which, wouldn't you do that? That's like 101 in a debate. Have you noticed that, I think Trent did it. So I'll give credit to Trent. Trent called out fallacies in Cosmic Skeptic. But aside from anybody, like nobody calls out fallacies. This is debate 101. And people get like, you're mean. You're mean in debates. No, calling out fallacies not being mean. That's what a debate is, dummy. They took the stones from here. They took the stones from here. All right, now. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. It's, wow, this is a beautiful auditorium. Uh, quite an event. Uh, <laughs> a beautiful auditorium. Tickets were very odd. I almost didn't get it's an odd to thing to come to the podium to, this is a beautiful auditorium. <laughs> Um, I would, I, by the way, I do have to point out if you guys don't know, we have our, uh, first official excellent based sponsor. Now these bros uh, have been longtime Jay's analysis supporters and they are a Patriot company. We're talking about chalk.com, right? And I have begun, I have begun using the products so i can now say it's not just me talking uh i have i mean i'm saying begun at a regular usage i'm talking about chalk.com right so i'm taking their dailies and i'm taking the additional boosters baby right and look first of all they've been longtime supporters and they got zucked they got zucked they got removed why because they were questioning the coof. So you know that they're good dudes, right? Um, and not only are they good dudes because they question the coof and have supported Jay's analysis for a long time, they're woke in the real sense. And what they're all about is helping you de soy, right? Because a lot of y'all out there, I've noticed a lot of y'all have lost that mojo. I mean, I've seen a lot of y'all, but I'm here to help. You call me Dr. Mojo, because I'm going to help you get it back. And, you know, it's hate speech to talk about masculinity and testosterone, right? But Mr. Testosterone is your friend in fighting the soy, right? And Chalk.com is there to help you in that process. It's clinically mm-hmm. studied, proven to boost your T. Talk about your Mr. T levels, fool. Literally. Chalk.com. Now they've got a bunch of different options. You can do the T boost. 90 day. You take it for 90 days. It's going to help you out. You can do the tongue cat. 100 to 1 extract. Wild harvested from pristine Malaysian rainforest. Right? Everybody's like, don't touch the rainforest. No, dude, we're going to go demolish those rainforests so that we can harvest that T. Right? I want Mr. T level energy. I want gold chains up to here, baby. And chalk.com is going to help you do that. And if you put in that promo code right there, go down there, you see that? J53, right? It used to be JAY. Now I want you to use J60. You get 60% off. JAY60, 60% off. 
That's an insane deal, dude. Insane. I mean, I, I Zuckerberg's probably crying right now. Weeping, dude. Every time you support me and chalk.com, when you get their supplements, Zuckerberg sheds a tear. Every time you take their supplement, he cries a tear. Literally. And they've got 600 plus five-star reviews, so we know this is legit, right? Legit, she legit mushrooms. Promo code J60 for 60% off. Promo code J53LIFE. J-A-Y-5-3-LIFE. Insane, insane deal. Insane in the membrane. Deals, dog. So, go to Chalk.com. Support the show sponsors. And let's get into beautiful Ravi Zacharias. <laughs> just joking, dude. Dinesh D'Souza. Oh, I forgot to do the recap with uh, because I wrote down all of Christopher Hitchens' so-called arguments, right? Let's recap Hitchens' garbage presentation. Pure garbage juice smoothie. First, uh, first thing we got was... I can't even... I can't read my stuff, dude. Evolutionary psychology is assumed. Evolutionary processes of comparative religion assumed. No arguments to prove this, just assume. Uh, a bunch of bloviating and pontificating and rhetoric based on objective morals, objective claims about things being wrong, being bad, being good, being what we ought to do. Then he appealed to the fact that the universe is literally nihilism and, I'm not joking, never-ending story argument that the nothing was coming to get us. I'm not joking, that's what he says. The nothing will get us, therefore God is not a designer. So because of my nothing, uh, by the way, he said healthcare was good. (laughs) What? I'm not sure why we're supposed to, in a meaningless Darwinian worldview, why we're supposed to at all care about somebody else's health. I mean, it's just nonsense, just ad hoc, totally arbitrary. Uh, What else? My big bang. My big bang proves that there's no purpose, no telos. And then he says 99% of Things have gone extinct, including our Geico cavemen friends and brothers, our monkey friends. Uh, I'm not sure why it's bad that things went extinct or that they don't. I mean, again, constant appeals to good and bad with no basis for good and bad. Um, I don't make the design argument. And precisely why I don't make the design argument is because uh, it's not, it presupposes things that it hasn't proven. So just to simply say that we see design everywhere is not a good argument. And it doesn't prove that the designer is the Christian God. So that's why the transcendental argument is a good argument. It's because it doesn't make these dumb arguments. It's not based on stupid presuppositions and faulty epistemology. Uh, Evil, suicide, B-O-M-B-E-R-S. The terrorists. The terrorists and much gashes. Right? Okay, why is that bad? Uh, I don't have any basis at all on your worldview to think anything's bad. Uh, and your argument is that religion equals suicide, B-O-M-B-E-R-S, therefore bad. Okay, that was not a good argument. And then, oh, Rokor. Rokor and chauvinism and toxic masculinity. Literally, that was what he argued. Rokor, chauvin. I mean, talk about like weak sauce cuckery, dude. This is the lamest argument I've ever heard from these people. This was as bad as... It was almost like just pure political rhetoric not even a debate like Winston Churchill during the Boer War he said it is always exhilarating to be shot at without result and I, these public intellectuals are just so tiring and lame I mean have you guys not figured out yet that you don't get to be a public intellectual if you're actually intellectual has anybody figured this out yet or is it just literally something that only intelligent people realize? And then everyone else is a bunch of idiots and think that normie public intellectuals are actually intelligent because it's just like, I guarantee you this dude is not going to even call out the litany of fallacies that should be called out. I said 
say this. I say this because who is this? M. Night is it M. Night Shyamalan? Bro, I, w- I wish M. Night Shyamalan was debating. I'm gonna bet you. I bet M. Night Shyamalan would do better than this dude. Everything that Christopher Hitchens says is true. He has hardly demonstrated religion to be a very serious problem at all. He seems to say that religion is built into human nature. Uh, uh oh, I like that. So he's at least going for the arguments. So I like where we're going here. It's an evolutionary development. Okay. That man has been searching for okay. explanations. Religion supplied functional explanations. Now perhaps we have better ones. Even if all this were true, I'm going to dispute it and show it's not true. But even if it were true, this would hardly be a damning indictment of religion. Uh, science itself has developed in the same way. It's been an explanation. It's gotten better over time. But what I want to do is meet Christopher on his own ground. Uh, here we go. Dude, you were going, uh, you were there on the right track. He was beginning. Like, he, he opened the door and peeked in to where he could have decimated this dumb argument from Hitchens, which wasn't even, I don't even know what, just a political speech, basically. And so, uh, so my hopes were just dashed right there. Now I want M. Night Shyamalan to come in and debate instead of this dude. I mean, dude, you, you opened the door. To destroy him, which you should have done, in terms of the arguments, in terms of the arguments, Father Damick, not literally destroy him. You open the door, you could have critiqued the, the crap out of this position and shown it to be the foolishness that it is. And you're going to shift from that to the common ground, evidentialist, normie approach. Meet him on his own ground. And so now you've just lost. I won't be surprised if, if you lose now. This is this is so embarrassing. Why did people do this? He says we should be doubters, and I'm going to be a doubter. He says we should be skeptics, and I endorse that completely. In this debate, at no time will I make any arguments that appeal to revelation, scripture, or authority. Uh-huh. Mm, maybe he's going to go for an internal critique, and this is rhetoric to say, okay, then I'll play your game. So uh, we'll give him a uh, we'll give him a fair hearing here, but I, I'm my hopes are still not high. Make arguments based on reason alone, and I want to engage the argument on Hitchens's own ground. Okay, so if he means presupping his position, then I'm I'm supporting this. It's not by making the easy argument for the utility of religion. It's good for us. It makes practical sense. It's consoling. Uh, that's all true. I'm going to actually make an argument for the truth. Of religion. And the argument I'm okay. going to make, well, I call it the presuppositional argument, but it's an argument that requires a little bit of explanation. Imagine if you're a detective and you're going on your sort of crime uh, and all the evidence points to a suspect. What? But it turns out he couldn't have done it. What? Did he say what I thought he said? I'm literally soying right now. Like, I'm soying my pants. <laughs> what? Did he say presuppositional argument? Is Dinesh D'Souza a pre- What? I'm frozen in my soy face right now. Should we pause and have a moment of silence? Does that does an apologist that's a public intellectual actually for the first time in history get a good argument other than Bonson? Should we? Lord, I just want to thank you that there's finally a public apologist who's not a complete idiot. Should we should we have a moment of silence for this? I think we should. Let's. I'm literally blown away. Like I'm like, I can't believe I just heard that. I had no idea what M. Night Shyamalan did in terms of apologetics. And so uh, now he's like my favorite public apologist. I don't know. I'm joking. I don't know. I, 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 I can't even talk, dude. He's made me uh, uh, like I'm speechless. Dude. Ravi Shyamalan just blew my mind. Now M. Night Shyamalan is now my favorite apologist. 
I can't believe what's happening right now. Is this real? Are we in a dream? Did the Cheetah Ori change the simulation? I'm like, I think we need, let's have a, uh, let's have a moment of like musical celebration. Uh Oh, I hope that didn't screw everything up by doing that. You can't downsize the windows because then everything just kind of like goes bonkers in this stupid setup here. But I mean, I want to like play celebratory music or something. I can't believe I just heard this. Is it, is this really happening right now? Okay, let's go. Why? Because the body was dumped in one location and he was in a completely different location. And then it hits you as a detective. Wait a minute. Perhaps the guy had an accomplice. Now, we don't know that he did. But the assumption that he did suddenly makes sense of all the other facts that were previously mysterious. Suddenly you see how the crime was committed to its very detail. If this seems like a little bit of an unusual way to argue, I want to emphasize that this is precisely the way in which scientists argue when faced with new phenomena. For example, scientists looking at galaxies out there... Dude, why WTF? <laughs> I love the Susan now. <laughs> There's not enough gravity to hold the galaxies together. They should be flying apart. And so scientists presuppose that there is some other form of matter, they call it dark matter, that must be there exercising a gravitational force. So even though we can't see I mean, he's already won, dude. Debate's already over. I don't even need, I'm, we're going to hear it, but I don't even need to hear the, I already know he's won. So, I mean, if he's at least aware of this, then he's already demolished this, this goober. Debate's over. So, we already give the win to D'Souza. The presupposition of dark matter clarifies the matter that is in front of us. Now, what I'm going to do is try to adduce some puzzling facts about light, and then ask whether the presupposition of God explains those facts, explains those facts better than any rival explanation. There we go. Chris Finally. Chris spent a lot of time telling us about evolution. And evolution as, a, as an effort to explain the presence of life on the planet. But of course, evolution does not explain the presence of life on the planet. Darwin knew that. Evolution merely explains the transition between one life form and another. That's very different from accounting for life itself. Consider, for example, the primordial cell. If you read Franklin Carroll's book, The Way of the Cell, <laughs> somebody said Bollywood Bonson. <laughs> uh, this is Greg Bonson, not uh, Jerry, Jerry, uh, Christopher. You're going to have to give an account for that. Not. So I'm trying to. This is. You should, they, they took the stones from here. They took the stones from here. That was. Hindu Bonson from Temple Doom. University of Colorado in Boulder. He describes the cell as a kind of supercomputer. It is of a level of complexity. Even Richard Dawkins in his work describes the cell as a kind of digital computer. Now the cell can't have evolved because evolution presupposes the cell. Evolution requires a cell that already has the built-in capacity to reproduce itself. How do we get a cell? The very idea that random molecules in a warm pond through a bolt of lightning assemble the cell would be akin to saying that a bolt of lightning in a warm pond could assemble an automobile or a skyscraper. It's preposterous. I like this because it's... The, his opponent, I'm sure, won't get this. He's not actually just making a basic bitch telos design argument. He's actually making what I always say the transcendental version of tel- of a design argument. So you can take the classical arguments, causation, teleology, right? And you can turn them into transcendental versions of those arguments. And that's a better way to do it. And I think that's actually what he's doing here. Dawkins knows it's preposterous, and therefore when asked, how did we get life originally? He said, well, maybe aliens brought it from another planet. It's ridiculous, but it's... In a way, the best explanation he could come up with, other than intelligent design. So there we go. We have the mystery of the cell. Yeah, and that's a good point, too. Uh, I mean, he didn't really flesh that out, but um, you'll notice that when atheists reach for things like aliens, UFOs, 
panspermia, all this nonsense that they think is somehow reasonable. How is that more reasonable than theism? I mean, it's just, it's not, right? But what it shows is a presuppositional commitment to unbelief, right? And that's something that Bonson always talked about, which is true. There's a fundamental commitment in the on the part of the atheist because he's essentially willed himself into that paradigm that anything that comes into his paradigm, any evidence that seems to conflict must be reinterpreted, you see. So it can't be God, therefore aliens are more rational somehow. Uh, I'm sorry, but what? How is that the case? It's not, but it's a way to interpret the evidence so as to, so as to say, well, it's anything but that God. And why is that? Well, ironically, Christianity actually has an explanation for why that is, which is that man is fallen. And as a result of being fallen, he intentionally rebels against God. He uses his logic and his reasoning, which is God given to reason against God himself. And so the analogy is it's like a child sitting on the lap of his father, slapping his father in the face, right? The father is upholding him as he slaps the father in the face. So here we have an argument on the basis of, I can't turn him up anymore. It's the video itself is really low volume. Everything is maxed out. So there's no way to make uh, Dinesh D'Souza any louder. So I've got the channel maxed out. So um, I don't know what else to say. Sorry, but we, we're not going to do the whole thing. Uh, the opening statements are fine because I'm sure that Maybe we'll do a part two tomorrow or something, but I mean, if he, if he is smart enough to know, you know, tag, this debate's over. Verse has a whole bunch of these constants, hundreds of them. Scientists have asked, what if he... Yeah, so he's given examples of constants and things in nature that are necessary for science to exist. And these are the things that you hear me argue all the time, right? You hear me argue all the time about invariant abstract principles you know objective principles mathematical realities abstract concepts right these things have to be the case for there to be logic or math at all constants. or reasoning or science science presupposes all of these constants that he's talking about and those constants can't be proven by science on which evolution depends what mm -hmm. if these constants were changed a little bit what if the speed of light were a little slower so now he's implementing a fine-tuning argument to the presuppositional approach, which is good. Sure. This question is addressed by Stephen Hawking in his book, A Brief History of Time. He says that if you change these constants of nature at all, and in, he's talking about the rate of expansion of the universe, he says if you change that, not 10% or 1%, but one part in 100,000 million million, we would have no universe. Not just homo sapiens, no complex life would have evolved anywhere. In other words, our very existence here is dependent upon... Uh, one thing I would critique here is that he's just sort of granting the evolution gibberish uh, narrative, which um, I understand that he probably is doing that for uh, rhetorical grounds, but it's just simply not true. So I, don't, I wouldn't have done this, but... And I think that it is... A, it's unfortunate, but I'm still going to give him the win. The fine-tuning of a set of constants in nature. We're not talking about just on Earth, the entire universe. This argument that is sometimes called the anthropic principle of the fine-tuned universe, this has put modern atheism completely on the defensive. Why should the universe be structured in precisely this way and no other way? What is the best explanation? Is there an atheist explanation? I'd like to hear it. Let's move on in thinking about evolution because evolution cannot explain the depth of human evil. Now, this is good because, I mean, I like he's he may not be advocating evolution, just saying that even for you to have your evolutionary paradigm or worldview or theories, you need these things to be the case. So if that's what he's doing, OK, but um, 
it sounds a little too like too much that he's granting too much to that paradigm. What I mean by this is simply this: evolution presumes cruelty, evolution presumes harshness, but it is a harshness tempered by necessity. Yeah, Think of a lion. that's what I said. This was essentially what we were saying about Hitchens. So I'll give uh, again a, another good point here for M Night Shyamalan. Yes. So think of a couple of moral facts. And I'm not talking about heroic deeds of greatness. Think of simple things. Getting up to give your seat to an old lady in a bus. Donating blood. There's a famine in Haiti. You volunteer your time or you write a check. Now, if we are evolved primates who are programmed to survive and reproduce, why would we do these there's a whole literature on this, and basically it comes down to this. The advocates of evolution say, well, evolution is a form of extended selfishness. If a mother jumps into a burning car to save her two children, that's because she and her children have the same genes. So what seems like an altruistic and noble deed is actually a merely a cunning strategy on the part of the mom to make sure her genes make it into the next generation. We're not talking about her Levi's. We're talking about her genetic inheritance. Or evolution appeals to what can be called reciprocal advantage. You scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. A businessman may be nice to a customer, not because he thinks he's a great guy, but because he wants him to come back into the store again. But these two common evolutionary strategies to explain morality don't explain the three examples I gave at all. I'm in a bus, the old lady hobbles in. She's not a relative, she isn't grandma. So genetic kinship doesn't come into it. And neither does reciprocal advantage. I don't say, well, you know, I think I'll give her my seat because next week I want her seat. Oh, this is good. No, you give up your seat because you're a nice guy. You give up blood. I'm, imp I'm blood. impressed with uh, Dinesh. I, I'm, I'm happy for what he's done here. Yeah. So in debate, and that's a, a clever way to go about this because if Hitchens is to respond to this by critiquing and saying that there is no there is no reason for the moral uh, responses of humans in these cases, then he's undercut all of his argumentation for his morals and superiority. So uh, if that's what Dinesh is up to, that's pretty clever. Because that would be like a skilled debate situation where you're leading the opponent into a cul-de-sac where he will trap himself. And that's, of course, as you guys know, what we always try to do, right? Because that's the best tactic in a debate is to get the opponent to hang himself by his own words. Yeah, that's a good point. There is a theist explanation, the God explanation, and there is a non-theist or atheist explanation. We have to weigh the two against each other. Right. Our contention is that the atheist explanation flounders yes. when confronted with all these facts. The complexity uh. of the cell, the fine-tuning of the universe, the fact of morality, the depth of human evil, the reality of morality in the world. So here you guys see, I didn't even know he did this. I mean, he's just presenting a basic transcendental argument. He's doing the presuppositional argument. He's saying that the atheist worldview cannot account for the things that the atheist worldview needs to argue for an atheist worldview. It's that simple. And the Christian worldview can. The Christian worldview's paradigm makes sense for 
how those preconditions are the case. That's it. It's that simple. Uh, that was a little weak there. I would have gone in the direction of trying to make this a specifically Christian argument. Um, but hey, uh, well, he gets, a, I mean, for at least going in the precept route, we give him points. So it's not perfect, but it's good enough. Yeah, good points. So when we put it By the way, again, remember everybody to, uh, I'll be reading the super chats here in a second. I don't know if that, is that atheist dude still around or did I wait? I forgot about that guy. I guess he, he actually did join the server. So if that atheist dude wants to pop on, if he wants to pop on and be proper, properly pop on, pop on over. He can, but I don't know if he's, if he's here anymore. Uh, anyway, we'll see. All together, the presupposition of God. God is invisible. I can see that. We can't see him. But if we posit him, all of these mysterious facts, suddenly the lights come on. Mm -hmm. It provides an explanation. Now, again, with any presupposition argument, there may be a better alternative explanation. And so I put the ball into Christopher Hitchens' court to say, if you can explain these facts better than I can, I will happily, as a skeptic, concede to your point of view. Give me a better explanation for these facts. Uh, I think that he's doing this to play into, right, let's say that your position's right. So I don't think he's actually saying that the atheist can give a better account, but he's saying, okay, go for it. So I think that's a rhetorical tactic that's, that's wise here. I don't think he's actually saying that, that he can do that. So the, fact of the guy that came to uh, the debate, which was that was like three hours ago. He, I, I guess he's the skeptical atheist in the discord. He chose Hitchens as his PFP. <laughs> I hope he's on here. Uh, let's see, because th this guy is going to be. It doesn't look like he's online. I'll, I'll leave it open until the end of the super chats. Um, because this, this will be fun. Experience. It's almost as if you go to a village and 95% of those people in the village say, we know this guy named Bill. Why? Because we interact with him. We relate to him. We I just want y'all to see my beautiful mullet. Five guys say we've never met Bill. And three of them say there is no Bill. The other 95% are making him up. Now, which is more likely? Is it likely that the three beautiful mullet? Beautiful mullet. Lying or hallucinating, or is it more likely that ninety-five percent are right and the other three percent just don't know the guy? When you look at the fact of religious experience in the world today, to simply write it off as a primitive explanation of why the why ancient man couldn't explain the thunder seems idiotically unrelated to the fact that religion serves current needs and current wants. So religion is not the problem. God is not the problem. God is, in fact, the answer to the problem. Thank you. That was overall good. I mean, I, I, I would have worded it a little stronger and been a little more f f aggressive and forceful, but um, that was good. I mean, there's no way. We'll, well, maybe we'll do a part two to this because we've already been going for three hours. Uh, but dude, there's no Hitchens is not going to be able to reply to that. I guarantee you, but we will see. And if, uh, Mr. Atheist, not 
the YouTuber, Mr. Atheist, but whoever this person is, if he's, if he ends up hopping online, we will uh, bring him in here, but I don't think he will. It looks like he's gone. And let's get to these super chats, baby. Remember also to uh, support the sponsors. Go to chalk.com and get your legit, she legit mushroom supplements and other supplements there. And uh, also you can support via the super chats. And uh, yes, I'm sorry that the sound, so I had everything cranked up as high as possible, but I think that video just has low sound. So let's get to the super chats and call uh, in court for $5. Oh, this was the super chat I missed on our comedy stream where we did mystery science theater riff tracks on eternal evil. That was a lot of fun. Shout out to everybody that was at the 80,000 subscriber stream. I uh, love all you guys. It's great to have reached 80 K. So glad for that. It's been a, a wild journey. But we made it, and next up, Lord willing, 100. She says, I'm assuming it's a she. Canada actually is this bad. Every female in the movie Eternal Evil is like the crazy cabinet ministers in Canada. <laughs> that makes perfect sense, right? Uh, if you didn't see our Mystery Science Theater Rift Tracks stream that we did, it was a lot of fun. It's uh, the terrible movie Eternal Evil. It was so bad, we only made it through half of the movie, but it was a lot of fun. So you go, go watch that one. But Theosis Pilgrim for $15. Do you have any recommendation for purchasing a set of the Church Fathers? Um, well, I would say that you probably would just do better to get a mullet. So um, I want everyone to appreciate this. I should just have done the whole stream like like this from the side so that you can see the beauty of what I did. You, you like that business nowhere party in the front party in the back business in the nowhere all right good job to M. Night Shyamalan he won the debate hands down It took all my energy spurging out. Although I have had more energy taking Seven Wonders from Chalk.com. Seven Wonders, baby. So if you can get your hands on the Philip Shaft set, I would get it. Um, I don't know if it's in print anymore. It's probably not. It used to be like $300. But other than that, you would just have to kind of get the individual volumes from St. Vladimir's Press, I guess. Um, there's just not that many options for the sets of the church fathers. The only other option is the Catholic university of America set, but like every volume is like 30 to $50. So it's super expensive, but there's just no, there's not, not nothing that can be done about that. Um, otherwise you could though, you can go to new advent and just print out individual essays because you know, a lot of the church father's essays are not that long, like on the incarnation by Athanasius, uh, right? This kind of stuff. Keep fighting the good fight. Thank you for all your work and the beneficial information that you put out. Well, thank you so much. Theosis Pilgrim. Appreciate you. The Palantir, $10. Jay, quick question I had regarding Orthodox Trinitarian theology. Are the titles son of God and God, the son interchangeable? Yes. They both refer to and pick out the same person, the hypostasis of the logos, the second person of the Godhead, Jesus. So that's who is being picked out in both of those titles. They are interchangeable. Um, son of God probably is typically intended to express that the son is eternally generated of the person of the father. So the father eternally generates the son. So son of God is expressing that relationship of the son to the father. God, the son is typically intended to signify that the d d God there is picking out divinity in, in terms of the divine essence of the divine nature that it's shared right between father, son, and spirit. And so God, the son signifies that he is homoousius of the same essence as the father. Also, can you comment on Son of Man? Right. Well, that 
is clearly intended to signify that he's fully man. So he has a fully human nature, right? Body, mind, soul, will. Uh, those those faculties and constituent components are all present in the logos, assuming human nature. Right? So he has a fully human nature, but he has no created hypostasis. He's not a created human hypostasis or a created human person. That is the heresy of Nestorianism. Palantir, $15. I have two additional questions. What is the Orthodox attitude, attitude towards the church fathers of the first millennium? They are saints and fathers as are the Eastern fathers. Uh, the difference, of course, being that the Constantinople I Council, the Second Ecumenical Council, it affirms the Cappadocian theology of the Trinity. So the normative Trinitarian theology for Orthodox Christianity is Cappadocian. So you said, what about St. Augustine? Well, St. Augustine is a saint, but we don't accept all of his teachings, just like we don't accept all of any church father teachings. right? And so St. Augustine's Trinitarian theology is not what the church accepted. Is it a mixed view? Uh, yeah, so it, it's a mixed view in the sense of what I said. Second question is triclavianism a heresy? Uh, I don't actually know what triclavianism is. <laughs> oh, I've never heard of that. So I know that a lot of people are surprised, but I don't actually know everything. <laughs> Just kidding. Dumb joke. Uh, no idea what triclavianism is. Let's see what it is. Triclavianism, the belief that three nails were used and... This is the exact number of the holy nails. I have no idea. I've never heard of that. So I, I'm not aware of any position on that. Never heard of it. MJ Bold, $5. Thank you for the work that you do, Jay. Thank you, MJ Bold. What's up? Shout out Pano. Pano Costoros, five bucks. Our good buddy Pano. Ontology has been replaced with psychology, says Yanaris. Uh, I, you have to be a, beware with Yanaris because he does have some modernist uh, heterodox tendencies. But that phrase is correct. Absolutely true. And really, we see that after uh, Quine and philosophy. Boy, oh boy, isn't that true? Uh, what a Gnostic trap most people are in, completely strung along by passions. Yep. I mean, unfortunately, the modern world is... Uh, I more and more am, am coming to see that materialism really is Gnostic. I mean, I, I've always known that there's comparisons but when i was listening to some recent lectures by some esotericists and hermeticists uh what they were saying literally sounded just like materialists so we'll be getting to that in the future i'm going to do an analysis of, of those two positions and show the similarity between rank materialism big bang and the magical thinking worldview of chaos uh magic proponents now I know that sounds kind of ridiculous. You say, why would you want to, who cares what a chaos magic proponent thinks? Because it's exactly what materialists say. That's what blew me away. I was listening to these two positions. They're both magical worldviews. It's crazy. Thought uh, through human eyes, $50. Thanks, dog. Appreciate that. 10 out of 10 dentists agree. Monkey have no value. Okay, I agree. <laughs> uh, let's be atheist materialists and let's be consistent and admit no thing have value. And if no thing have value, then monkey have no value because monkey are part of thing. So of all thing that have existence, no thing have value, monkey thing, therefore monkey have no value. Fly Daddy 101, 234, 234. J are books icons. No, uh, there's a similarity between some books like the Holy Gospels and icons, because when you go to the liturgy, both will be revered because icons are presenting realities just like the Gospels are presenting realities. So in that sense, they're both iconographic, um, but like books aren't icons, no. Uh, books aren't liturgical items. 
except for prayer books or liturgical books. But my copy of uh, Eat, Pray, Love, which I read on a daily basis, my Eat, Pray, Love is not an icon. Dank Sire, $5. Did you do a breakdown of morals and dogma? Uh, we didn't do a breakdown, but we did a kind of an analysis overview uh, many years ago with John and Chris. And the I think it's... It's, I think it's still on YouTube, but it's called something like uh, Modern Education, Ecumenism, Modern Education, and Babylon, or something like that. And we go through kind of the basic problems in morals and dogma there as well. But we, Jamie and I also just did an analysis of Manly P. Hall's uh, America's Secret Destiny, and it's the same critique that we do there. So... Gen Z philosophy, five dollars. Can you do? Sorry, my mind's turning to mush because it's getting late and I'm getting tired. Can you s please say which Dire Wave album was used at the beginning of tonight's stream? If you go to uh, Amid the Ruins 1453 channel, there's two new Dire Wave uh, short things, like samples and it's one of those two ender twenty dollars debate review debate review let's go thanks for the debate reviews all of your content of which i find knowledgeable and full of wisdom thank you so much these debate reviews are my favorite god bless thank you ender i'm glad you like these some wow hundred dollars golden arm 2007 uh golden arm sounds like a Failed James Bond movie, Golden Arm. I like it. Oops, I messed with my perfect background. Okay. Golden Arm. <laughs> Having studied directly under Dr. Uh oh, directly under Bonson. Woo! We got freaking James Bond villains in the chat right now. Sending hundred dollar super chats that studied under Bonson. Whoa, dude, it's getting real up in here. He says, "I studied on, I studied under Doctor Greg Bonson," and he says, "I'm always excited to hear the influence that he has had after his death." Yes, we we studied uh, not directly under Bonson, but we studied at Bonson. Actually, I went to Bonson Seminary for about a year. Very excited when I found you and Father Deacon Dr. Ananias. Thank you very much. Yes, we're both glad, I'm sure, to hear that you are excited to hear about us. <laughs> uh, prior to this, I thought that I was the only Orthodox person hanging out on presuppositional island and drinking that tag orange juice. You were not. Well, you say tag OJ. Maybe you mean it, the presuppositional argument for OJ Simpson. Uh, I do not know what the presuppositional argument for OJ Simpson is, but it sounds pretty awesome. So let me know, Golden Arm, what the tag argument for OJ is. I like that. But no, we're here with you on Presub Island, and we are toasting to you, Greg Bonson and OJ Simpson together. Did you know OJ is actually a presuppositionalist? I mean, why can't he be if M. Night Shyamalan and Dinesh D'Souza are? No one $5. I was drawn towards chaos magic for that very reason. That it presents itself as some like applications for altering the quantum realm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's why quantum phone, quantum physics, materialism, multiverse mel melds perfectly with goober renaissance chaos magic nonsense right they think they're like gonna turn make reality happen with their mind or whatever it's stupid but uh yeah we'll be deconstructing that pretty soon all right a lot of fun tonight everybody have a good night and be sure and like and share and uh go to chalk.com get the supplements that you need support our sponsors we love